CPGC HQ. And I'd like to welcome you to today's user share, Lab It Up with Citrix Unidesk. This is part two, gonna focus on PBS, and uh, this is partly in response to some of the feedback we got after the first really successful one, so I'm excited to have everyone back today. Um, just real, some, some really quick housekeeping. Um, we have a question area in the GoToWebinar control panel. I'd like you to type your questions into that box, and we will keep an eye on those and ask those throughout the presentation. I um, also want to let you know that this is being recorded and will be posted on mycugc.org uh, shortly afterwards, probably sometime tomorrow, and you will also receive a link via email to the recording. On our call with us today, we have Rob Zalowski and Robert Shaw, both with Citrix Unidesk. Um, they're going to be driving a lot of the presentation, and we also have Andy Whiteside from Charlotte CUGC Local Group and David Ott from the Triad, North Carolina CEGC. And um, they're gonna keep an eye on the questions for us and keep the discussion going. And with that, I will turn things over to Andy for a really quick welcome and then we'll dive right in. Hey Stephanie, thanks thanks for doing that. And just so everybody knows, Triad, North Carolina, David, that's, uh, that's Greensboro, uh, Winston-Salem, High Point, right? So pretty much the center of the state. Um, so thanks everybody for joining. This is a, a concept that David and I came up with um, a few months ago, which is the idea, and I know you guys get to see a lot of third-party products, you get to see a lot of uh, presentations, but the goal here is really to show the technology in more of a demo format in a lab, kind of proof of concept mode. So that's really the whole idea with this whole Lab It Up series, and uh, a few months ago now, I guess maybe two months ago, uh, we had the guys from Unidesk, which is now Citrix, of course, uh, Rob and Robert here to uh, help us with uh, the layering technology of Unidesk, which Citrix acquired. Oh, I guess maybe four or five months ago. Now it's all it's all happening so fast. But they did a great job with part one, uh, which we did a, a our demo was focused around adding a virtual layer to a Citrix machine creation service uh, catalog. And there was a lot of questions from that around um, you know, how to do it with PBS because you know most of you uh, hardcore Citrix admins, at least historically and probably for a long time to come, have been using PBS. So we kind of challenged Rob and Robert to come back with us and show us uh, the PBS version of how to use Unidesk so that we covered both of those uh, technologies. And that's that's why we're here today. And uh, welcome uh, the, the guys from Unidesk slash Citrix or Citrix Unidesk. And uh, we, we definitely, like Stephanie mentioned, the, the part one has been recorded, uh, and uh, now we're going to move on to part two. We do have a question for you guys, though. Stephanie, is the, is the poll ready? Yeah, I'll turn it on right now for you. So what we're going to do is just poll so we get an idea so that Rob and Robert have a good understanding of who watched. So let's change the poll just slightly. If you have either, if you have either participated in the first part one or you were um, able to watch the video from part one, uh, if you could indicate yes, and if you did not uh, do either one of those, if you could indicate no in the poll, just so Rob and Robert have a good idea who's online here and, and sure. what they need to cover. We are certainly going to do a high-level overview of part one, um, but maybe if there's a lot of no's, maybe we'll dig a little deeper. But uh, just give us an idea. So I guess we'll keep that open, Stephanie, for what, about 30 seconds more? Yeah, a little bit longer, yeah. We're almost 77%. <laughs> okay. So uh, Rob and Robert, uh, welcome guys. You want to just give a quick uh, background on, on from both of you guys as we're trying to kill this 30 seconds? Rob, you can go first. Yeah, uh, certainly. My name is Rob Schaub. Um, uh, so I also uh, was uh, a part of the Unidesk team in the acquisition. Um, spent some time in the, quite a bit of time in the VDI, server-based computing arena. Uh, been at Dell and the VDI uh, team, Wise team, as well as uh, it's my second time at Citrix. I um, uh, was the uh, uh, SE for the Southeast uh, on the core team. Uh, back in the day, I've also spent time in uh, as an administrator, Citrix administrator in my past, as well as uh, working as a VAR implementing um, Citrix and other uh, VDI uh, technologies. I am based in Atlanta, Georgia and uh, uh, certainly uh, work with the, you know, the, the core team a, a good bit uh, as, uh, uh, as the acquisition has happened. 
So here's, here's the reality of Robert Shaw. He realizes the value and importance of application virtualization, whether it's presentation, streaming, or layering, because he is truly a virtual desktop guy uh, and has that background, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that we would do a lot at Dell, because we, we would basically say, so you're implementing VDI, you know, you can, you know, uh, you can live in image uh, hell, if you will, and have lots of different images, or you can have one image that has everything in it, both of which are kind of their own unique set of hell, I guess. Uh, or you, you know, you could do a double hop thing where you can put the receiver in the desktop. And, and so, you know, we would usually make those recommendations or we would re make the recommendation that you could use Unidesk and get the best of both worlds and and have the least amount of effort to have to administer. And that's, I think right. that's one of the main values and drivers for Citrix's uh, acquisition of, of Unidesk. Yeah, it's almost a necessity. Robert uh, Zylowski, that's how I say it anyway. Um, you want to give us a quick bio on yourself? Sure, that's not bad. And I've heard a lot worse. Um, Hi everyone, I'm Rob Zalowski. I'm a solution architect at Unidesk slash Citrix. I still say Unidesk automatically. Sooner or later I'll, I'll get the Citrix part down. Um, I've been here about seven years doing that. Before that I was a consultant around all these same technologies and virtualization for 17 years and before that I worked in IT for eight years. So I know what you guys have gone through and are going through and kind of lived through as far as that goes. Um, it's good to see I think from our um, question there. We've got about 50% of the people were on the last session, 50% not. So what we'll do is um, go into a little bit of a summary since since not everyone has seen it, but not the same detail. I would, you know, it, um, if you get a chance, go back and see the first one too, right? I think you'll get something out of that as well. So uh, David Ott and myself will kind of monitor the questions and and hit you with them as they come in, Rob. But let's uh, let's transition over to you and get the the presentation part of it started at least. Okay, sure. Um, no worries. So today, and as we talked about, we're going to do uh, Citrix app layering, and we're going to do it from the point of view of PVS. We're going to you know talk about layers and the types of layers and the things around that as well. But the concentration on the last one was actually using MCS to deploy um, the technology. Right, when you get it done in here, we're just going to shift that a little bit and make C PVS the technology we use to deploy. Um, so going back a little, what you'll see is we'll do this kind of high-level summary. What is layering at its basics? A, a few slides on that. How does the architecture get implemented? A few slides on that. Again, this will be shorter than the last time, so go back and watch the, the other video. You'll get more detail there on that top part. We'll talk about what the prep is for the POC stuff that we're doing. We're not doing a beginning to end POC, it takes too long, right? So some of the stuff's in place. We're actually using my lab, which is fully functioned out, but we're gonna, for instance, configure PVS server to work with app layering, et cetera. Um, and then we're gonna do some POC steps, um, literally on the fly to show how it's done, right? So the basics, a good place to start is what is layering, right? And what we like to say is layering itself is not a product, Right, layering um, is kind of an, an idea, right? And the actual technology behind layering is file system virtualization and registry virtualization, right? So that we're presenting what we capture in a layer to a machine so it looks like a normal machine, right? What is an actual layer? A layer is uh, a bunch of files on a file system that are presented and a bunch of registry settings that are presented. We capture changes to the file system, changes to the registry in a, in a disk. We store that in a library and we replay that back on a virtual desktop or a session host so that it looks like the disk is virtualized and there's only one disk and the registry is virtualized and there's just one registry. Right? Um, the whole point of all that is to make it easier to package and easier to put it together and easier to manage, right? Which we'll get into in a little bit. Um, ease is really the, the key part of why layering has become successful because a lot of application deployment technologies are not easy. They're very hard and they take a lot of time and they take a lot of very expensive resources to, to make that happen right. So we're trying to make it easy. Um, one thing you can see from this chart that happens about layering from the Citrix layering point of view that's pretty important is we actually start with the operating system. It's the only app layering that does that, right? The operating system becomes a layer. And we 
layer on top applications and we call it a layer cake because we're putting these application layers on in a certain order, right? And they're applied in that order. Uh, and at the top there, you see we actually have a writable or personalization layer. Um, that's coming, it's partially there, we'll talk about that, but that gives you the ability to customize for a user what they store as a layer so that you get the operating system, you get applications, and you get user writable layers all part of the technology. Okay. Hey Rob, you're probably going to go into this, but uh, I've been you know, boning up on uh, Unidesk lately. And uh, a lot of conversations come up about resource and how much resources is required to do this and, you know, and, and then where is it really happening. And so things I've learned, right, is not a lot of overhead because it's all happening at the OS level within Windows technologies, really, when you, when you break it all down. Correct. And, you know, of course, there's a lot of different places you can look at that. From the, from the infrastructure standpoint, I will talk about that in a little bit, so I won't cover it here. But from the actual what's going on in a desktop standpoint, you're right, the way our technology works is we have a filter driver that sits in Windows and it takes a bunch of disks and it makes them look like a single disk if you're using our elastic layering. Um, when you do that, all we're really doing is, is modifying the path to files, right, to point to the disk that those files are in. So that doesn't add a lot of overhead. It's like 0. .00001 seconds per action, right, of trying to find a path that the operating system is trying to find. That's very slow. Um, interestingly, so, so applications run with pretty much native speed. It's not quite, but it's pretty much. There are instances, though, where performance is affected, right? It's not a panacea. If you modify a file that's in a layer, right, we can't actually modify that file because the layers are shared. So we have to copy that file to a writable part of the desktop. That copy operation is extra. And that does add a little bit of slowness. So for, but realize it's only on files that get modified that are in the layer. So there are some things that can get a little slower, but in general, performance is equally as good, whether you're using layering or not. Hey, hey, Rob, and someone's already brought up the uh, user personalization layer, aka the profile type of uh, piece. So at some point in here, if you can talk about it, if you have details on it, bring it up. If not, it'll be, it'll be something we add as a part three. Absolutely. No, I'm gonna. I'll talk about it. Um, maybe maybe when we're doing the PLC too, we can show it a little as well. Um, so you know, it kind of fits into this slide, right? For us, again, with app layering, everything's a layer, right? It's not true of all the layering technologies, but it is true of ours, right? We start with the operating system layer, we create what are called application layers, right? And then we have something called the platform layer. But you can do everything. You not only can you do, you have to do everything in a layer with us. You can't take layering and and strap it onto machines that you already have deployed. You can't put it onto things that you deploy with SCCM or whatever. It's its own thing, right? So you have to start with what we call an OS layer, which you're going to build and manage as part of the operating system. And then you build the application layers on top of that. What's neat about the fact that Citrix app layering includes the operating system layer, it means we can also include all the types of applications that don't get included in other app layering and other app virtualization products, like applications that have kernel mode drivers, early start services, services that are dependencies of other services, things that use consoles, all those are okay with Citrix app layering. Where you put them might matter, but you can create layers out of them and you can manage them as layers. That's, um, that's the crazy hard to believe piece when you've lived in a world of app presentation virtualization or application packaging, aka streaming virtualization. When you start talking about some of those core services, it, that's when you start to wonder, this, how can this be? And then once you realize it, then you realize this is a whole different world we're talking about here. Right. You know, things like antivirus, right? That's the thing you think, wow, you know, how can you do that, right? And, yep. um, and that's one of the big advantages here is that you use the same process to manage something like installing antivirus that you use to, to install Notepad++, right? You don't have to use a different method to do that, um, which is a big advantage, right? Absolutely. A um, couple other things on this slide you'll see. We say on-prem, on cloud, and hybrid, right? Because this app layering for technology was designed to work with most hypervisors, at the same time, you can use multiple hypervisors if you want. You know, if you're a really big company and you have multiple different constituencies and they want to use multiple different hypervisors, you can from the same console, from the same set of layers. It's easy to do. Um, you can do on-prem and cloud as two separate hypervisors. I want to do, 
you know, vSphere and I want to do Azure, right? You don't have to do any extra work to do that. And the last slide on there is really important. We'll get into that more, but we have pre-boot and elastic layering. So there's two types of layering that we do, and I'll explain why we actually have two different types. So delivery methods. One is you, you build a library of layers, right? A layer can have one application in it, a layer could have 10 applications in it, whatever you package together goes into that layer. When you deliver the layer, you deliver those applications, right? That's up to you how you manage what's in a layer. You can keep them all separate or put them together, but you're going to build a library of layers that's, you know, you'll have an OS, let's say you're doing uh, Windows 7 like we are today in our, in our lab to show it, and then you create a bunch of application layers for that. I can take any of those layers that I want, and I can include them in what we call a layered image, right? So I create something called an image template. I say I want these 12 layers in that. I then publish that into a provisioning system like PBS. And what we do is we merge all those layers together to a single disk file. We can store it as a VHD. We push it up into the PBS store. And what you have is a normal VDisk in PBS created from all those different layers, right? That's called a layered image and that's one way you can deliver layers to, to users. And Rob, that's deliver the, that layer that's the historical way of doing that's way that's the way you guys have done it since early? Actually it's uh, our technology's kind of been different, but from from this 4.0 product, yes, yeah. that was the first thing that came out, right? Was to deliver layered images that way. Our older products worked with lots of layers, but they did it by desktop, not by what I'm about to talk about, which is elastically by user. Right. So in Unit S2, if you would have done that, you could actually, you build, in that technology, you used to build desktops, and you could put whatever layers on the desktop she wanted, and then a user used that desktop, they got whatever was on that, right? So you didn't have the concept of a highly available desktop for that user. You had a dedicated desktop for them that had their layers on it. Yeah. Can, can I give a quick oh, example? Okay. Sure. Quick example of that, that because I've, you know, over the course of the past six months, been trying to learn your technology as well. You know, and, and I haven't made a lot of cakes in my life, but I've been involved in making a few. Is that would be like the idea of taking all your cake pans and, and putting them together separately, sticking it into the magic oven, and it comes out as a layered cake, right? That first option is different layers. They go into this magic oven. They come out as one cake, and then you do with that cake what you need to, like put it into PBS and, and, and make it you know, deliverable from there. Correct, yep. And in the test technology part, and so I could take the same cake and deploy it to PVS or MCS or ViewLink clones or something else, right? But um, correct, you're putting it all together, and then it looks just like a normal um, cake with one layer, right, with everything in it. Okay. Now, the the second thing on that slide is kind of interesting. That's what we're calling elastic layers, right? We called that. That works a little differently. We, in Elastic Layer, what we do, if you assign that to a user group, right, and on login, if it's VDI, you, and there's some other ways to deliver it, but normally on login, we'll interrogate a share, and then we'll assign and mount disks from a file share just for that user um, on that machine. So if it's VDI, we're mounting the disk, and that user's getting access to it because of an Active Directory assignment to a group. So what we're doing here is we're dynamically delivering applications, layers to that user based on their, their login. Now it's a Windows technology, right? What we're doing is we're mounting a VHD from a share. So you're gonna create a highly available share. The machine's gonna mount it. The neat thing about that is we're not transferring anything. So from a, we were talking about performance before, from a performance perspective, you get the advantage that it's really just like mapping a drive. I do a connection. Um, it is going to have to check a little bit. It's going to have to look to see, does it need to, for instance, add a service? And if it has to, it will add the service and it will start it. Um, but if it's just a normal application, we'll have to do it. It's just going to connect it. So whatever layers that you have assigned to you, they'll get connected to your machine, mounted on your machine. But not much will be transferred over the network for that, unless you use it. If you go to use the app, it's treating the network and the, the share as a SAN. And it's going to run those applications at a block level off of that VHD file that's sitting on the share. It's kind of a neat technology and a neat way to do it. What's really nice about it, of course, for our environment here where we said you can talk to any platform, any hypervisor, is that it's all above that, right? From us, we can work into any infrastructure and do this elastic layering, and you can get those dynamic apps. But the big advantage to, to customers of Citrix is now I can manage the apps that everyone's going to get as part of the image, 
and then I can give one-off apps, which means I have a smaller number of catalogs, a smaller number of delivery groups that I have to deal with to give people the applications they need in a complex environment for, for it to work. Because if you use the other type of technologies that are out there, you end up with more apps that you have to have in the image and a lot more images to manage, which makes it very complex. Again, we're trying to make it simpler to use. Yeah. I mean, it kind of sounds like the nirvana of what we've all been looking for for app decoupling, app virtualization. We think it's good. <laughs> We're pro. So, and, and you know, I think up. everyone on this call has used all the technologies that are out there. So we know, you know, first of all, nothing's perfect, and I won't say this is perfect either, right? There are some challenges out there just like there were with everything. But we really do get a much higher percentage of applications that work in this than any other app delivery platform I've used before. Hey, David, sounds uh, like you had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I was, I was going to say that, that um, there is typing that can be heard over everybody's talking. So someone's typing loudly. Somebody's got one of the old clicky keyboards. Yeah, okay, yeah. great, thanks. <laughs> Somebody who's an organizer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that was me. I, I, I muted it. I, I kept going. I wasn't going to say it. <laughs> well, you, got, you guys know it wasn't me because I don't type that fast. <laughs> All right, so going a little bit to the architecture, right, what makes up this technology. Um, so when you download this, and I'll show you in a little bit how you download it, right, but when you download this, you download something called an Enterprise Layer Manager, which is a virtual appliance. It's based on CentOS. Um, it includes, so, so with this technology, there's no, you don't have to set up a database and SQL server anywhere and connect to it or any of that. It's all inclusive. The, the whole thing runs from the appliance. The appliance has a MySQL database included. We don't need a huge database, right? It's pretty easy. If you back up the appliance, you back up not only the database, all the, the business logic, but also all the layers, right? They're all stored within that appliance. Yeah, I, I will admit that was me clapping. <laughs> about the database. Um, it, the, it is a web UI driven thing. I'll admit it's Silverlight. I apologize for that, right? We've been planning to get off Silverlight for a while. It's mostly Silverlight to the low HTML5. We will be getting off Silverlight. It's not like we don't know. It's just a lot of work for us to do. Um, but for now, you have to access it with uh, a browser that can handle Silverlight. Which yeah, that was that was the that was me, shrinking. That was me booing under my breath on that one. But that's good. <laughs> you guys are working on it. Um, yeah, you know, it's a couple of man years of work, but hopefully now we have a little more resource with Citrix. Maybe it'll be a little quicker. Right? We'll see whether yeah, I'm sure you get there. Um, from a support, there are versions for Hyper-V, Zen Server, vSphere, Nutanix, and Azure. Right? So you can run the actual appliance on any of those. Right? You download the right version. For, for those. Remember, you can interface to all of those as well, but it, it doesn't matter where you run the appliance, you can interface with all the different hypervisors and, and technologies. Okay. Um, so that's the brains, and you'll see it. We're going to log into the console. You'll see it plenty today. Uh, we also have a share required to do the elastic layering stuff. And I say a share, but if you're doing production, it might be several shares or many shares, depending on different technologies that you use. Um, the neat thing about the way we did it is if that appliance is down, when your machines are in production, it doesn't hurt anything, right? We put the assignment for who gets what elastic layer with JSON files sitting on the share. So if the share is available, the layers are available, that's all you need, right? Um, if you copy that share to another place, right, you have a backup of it, you still have everything you need. Um, so from a recovery standpoint and an HA standpoint, you don't need to make the enterprise layer manager HA. All you really need to do is back it up because right, it's not something that's part of the production environment except when you want to change change things. And, the last and share, though, that's pretty important. Go ahead, Go ahead yes. What would happen if, uh, for some reason, that share became unavailable while the user was in the session? Um, depend, it, it depends. Most of the time, it just means those applications wouldn't be available. But depending on where that, like, what's actually happening, if, if you know, antivirus, if you were delivering something on the share that had a service that became unstable or something, it could make the desktop unstable. It's possible. Um, I haven't seen it often, but most of the time it's just you you can't get to your applications. Though it's obviously it's not something you want, right? So you, you, ideally you'd want to architect around that by using um, a clustered file system rather than a 
DFS or something like that. Um, but if you if you absolutely don't have the money and you still want to use the feature, you can use it. Just realize if it goes down, it might not be good. Um, so the other thing about the elastic share is that performance-wise, it has to be able to keep up, right? You know, with the load that you're putting on it. Now, remember, you, what you can do is you can have multiple elastic shares, and there's a registry setting on the client that defines where that looks for that. So you could, for instance, say I have 2,000 looking at this share, 2,000 at this, 2,000 at that, and just have a GPO that defines that for a set of machines, right? And you put 2,000 machines in a GPO kind of thing. Um, you might be able to get bigger numbers depending on what technology you're using for that share. Um, if you do use the user writable, so Andy brought up before, we have user writable share, right? And some of that, uh, right now it's in labs. We call it labs, which is beta for Windows 7, right? So you can test the user writable layer now with Windows 7. We're about to come out with it in labs, which is beta for Windows 10, right? So you'll be able to do that. And we're hoping by the end of the year, although it, it hasn't put in co concrete yet, to have the user writable layer for session hosts, right? Because we're going to have that there as well. Um, and actually, it does bring to mind, I should talk a little bit about session hosts with Elastic Layer. Um, and Rob, by session hosts, you mean, layer. you mean ZenApp or remote desktop, multi-user server desktops and apps, right? Correct. Yep. Um, let me finish this one thought, then I'll go into that. If if you do use the user writable layer in your architecture, um, you do need to be concerned about the performance of that because all user rights will go into that. Right? So it really needs to be Flash for the most part if you're doing that. Um, so quick back to um, actually let me see. hold on one sec. Let me. You know what? I have that on the next page. Give me a sec. Um, so we have the Elastic Share. I'll come to that then. Um, since, especially since we're talking about PVS today, we do have something where we use connectors, right? We push an image up to a particular technology using a connector. PVS is the one instance where um, we need to actually install something to enable that connector to work. So you have to install a small agent on a PVS server so that we can talk to it and push files up to it. It's actually really pulling files from our appliance. Um, but I'll show you later, we're going to be installing it. We'll see how that works. And we'll go over the connectors then, uh, which connectors are the things that have the logic that know how to talk to another system like vSphere or Hyper-V or Zen server, what have you. Okay. So this, I think, explains a little bit about that, Andy. So, you know, if we look at the two deployment methods and um, we have this idea of we create an image. If you're just using the layered image and you're not using elastic layering, we have nothing running on the machine. We just push up, we create that V-disk, and then it's just like a normal V-disk, right? There's nothing special working. At that point, we've merged everything ahead of time to put it into that machine. If you're using elastic layering, it's a little different. We have a service called Guest Layer Services that's running in the VM, whether it's a Zen app server or a VDI desktop. Um, we have a filter driver running in that machine. It's a file system and a registry filter driver that virtualizes the file system in the registry. And as you log in, we're attaching these disks and virtualizing them using those filter drivers to make it look like a single file system and a single registry. We do that in VDI, and, and that's a little easier to understand, but we also do that in, in um, session for, you know, in a Zen app host or an RDSH host by session, right? So I can actually have a different set of layers for one user on the same Zen app server than another user based on their session ID and what they're allowed to access via those elastic layers. Right? Um, and eventually the user layer will be part of that for Zen app as well. Right? Okay. And I am getting ahead of myself again here. I'm showing that. Sorry about that. I'm terrible at the marketing slide part of this, right? So VDI, you log in, maps your drives, you get whichever you get. A session host, it's an app, RDSH, you log in. Just for your session, you see the layers you're allowed. Somebody else on the same machine sees a different set of layers. If you log in as the administrator, you would see all the layers, right? Because it would get attached to that host. Um, but the people who have access can only see their layers. Hey, hey, Robin. This is the key here. Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, the the key here is you know we're doing we're making it available to the user at the user level. This isn't true app isolation. However, this does goes a long way toward providing access to the apps the users need, right? Correct. The the big deal here, of course, is that you can have many more use cases without many many more images, right? So, you know, I can by having this kind of dynamic ability to deliver um, custom layers to to users on the same um, silos. I don't have to have 100 or 150 different um, silos in my ZenApp environment. I can just have a smaller number uh, and then have the customization come from them being able to attach uniquely to these layers, right? So um, in a lot of instances, you might decide, you know, if you're a, a big ZenApp customer and you hadn't gone VDI yet, maybe with this new ability, I don't even need to do VDI. I can do desktops on ZenApp and I can get the kind of flexibility I need without going VDI. Right, it's possible. Okay. Last image on the deck, and I just wanted to show this quickly because DR is always important. Um, what I really like about the way these technologies work is DR is easy, right? And DR is not usually easy, especially if there's any persistence involved. But here we have the images. You push the image up as a PVSV disk or an MCSVM. Right, or a link clone VM. All you need to do is replicate that VDisk to another site, right, like you normally would, and you have the image part of what you're trying to do ready for DR. And then I have the share, right, and the share has all the one-off apps, and not only that, in the share has an assignment file for who gets the apps. If I replicate that to DR, <clears throat> when the user logs in over there, they're going to get what they're supposed to get, right, just for the mere fact that you put that share over there and you made it available. Um, you might have to change a registry set, <coughs> excuse me, a registry setting on the system if your naming convention is different in DR, though it doesn't always have to be. Um, but that's easy, right? When you deploy the machines in DR, you have a GPO that defines that setting of where they go for that elastic share. If you're using the user layer, it's a little harder, right? Because the user layers, while the elastic app layers are read-only and they're not locked, right? So you can copy them a little bit easier. Um, the user layers, this user writable layer, gets locked when it gets mounted. So if you're going to do some kind of copy for DR, then you have to have something that tries, you know, over and over to make sure that it's not in use so it can copy it. Or you have to do something like SAN replication underneath it to get it copied over where the file system doesn't care, something like that. Okay. Any other questions asked out there that we should answer before I start on the PSR? As far as elastic layers go, um, say I have a, a Zen app deployment and um, I have, I guess, what, uh, WinZip is an elastic layer. Um, how do you, how do you pr provision that to a user? Because, I mean, Studio is not going to know about that. By Active Directory Group. So what you do is you assign a group to um, the layer. Right, and then we actually do it by version because you can have different versions of layers as you patch it, et cetera. Um, but usually you'll create a couple WinZip groups. You create, I'd say, one to three. I usually use um, dev test prod, right? So WinZip dev, WinZip test, WinZip prod. You drop whatever users you want to have WinZip into that group or groups that you want to have it in that group, either way. Um, and then you attach that group to the layer, right, in layer version. And I'll, I can show you how to do that when we bring up the console. Um, okay. But it's pretty easy to manage. It's pretty much the same way you would do AppV or, or kind of any of the other virtualization management things. Okay. Any other questions we should hit before we move on while we're on this? Uh, there's, a, there's a question in the uh, question box here. Um, does the OneDrive component work with layering? Um, well, the, Problem is that OneDrive up updates itself so frequently. So you, one, I mean, OneDrive, the software can be introduced as part of a layer, um, but it seems to me almost every time you log in, it tries to update itself, which will work. It'll just have to do it multiple times, right? If, if it's doing that, um, and the user might have to log in each time if it doesn't save. It depends if you're using the user layer or not when we get to that. But if it doesn't save their password and everything, they'd have to authenticate each time.
So there's a there's a question here, more of a well, it's a statement and a question, but uh, so basically someone was asking, so you could have Zen app servers with no applications installed and all layered uh, based on the user with elastic layering or with the traditional you know layering of the image itself. Uh, and the answer to that is yes in both cases, right? You could. Well, the, here's the thing: there are rules around what can be an elastic layer. So anything with a kernel driver, anything with a that's a dependent service of another service, uh, anything that's a third-party driver in Windows, um, all those things have to go into the image, right? So there are certain things you have to put in the image because either they need to be there when the machine boots or they need to go through our normal merge process to, for instance, get the Windows um, driver store to work properly, to have fusion keys work properly, or those kinds of things. So um, yes, in theory, you could have nothing installed and do it all elastically, but it probably won't work that way. There'll be some 10, 15, 20% of apps that you need to put in the image. Well, so let me let me just clear that up, because I heard the way you said it, and I know you know what you're talking about. Um, you can do all of this with Unidesk. It's the kernel mode stuff that has to go in the traditional layering approach. It's the user traditional apps that can all go in the elastic layer. Elastic layer can't be the answer for everything, but Unidesk can do almost everything in one form or the other. Correct. Okay. Exactly right. In fact, the, the only things that don't work are things that just don't work with kind of image deployment usually. You know, so for instance, um, a lot of VPN, like monolithic VPN applications where when they install, they actually take a hash of the machine and maybe the MAC address and something else where they were installed security-wise to make sure they, they're on the same machine so they can't be kind of out fox. Well, that doesn't work in any imaging type deployment technology. Now, when we have the user layer, you can install the VPN in the user layer. That might, that would probably work, right? But but in general, something like a VPN wouldn't work. SSL VPN would be fine, not a monolithic VPN. That, that's just an example, something like that. But um, most applications will work, right? Not all applications. For that. Um, so another uh, question before you move on, Rob. Somebody asked about licensing, and I, don't, I know you touched on this earlier. So as it stands right now, everybody who has a Zen desktop under um, under software maintenance license, software maintenance being the keyword, gets Unidesk. The question still is out there, you know, who will get the elastic layer portion of it? I don't know if you know, I don't know at, the, at this point in time, which, you know, standard enterprise platinum gets that yet. Yeah, actually, it's not the way we chose to slice it up. So if you get it, you get elastic layering and regular layering. Okay, um, great. You do have to have, um, what is it called, customer success services? support right so not not just SA so if you if you're on the older version of support talk to your sales team right and work yeah. something out with them um, but with the way we, they chose to do it is if you don't have platinum right so if you have enterprise or and I'm forgetting the other there's one other version you so will VDI still, edition enterprise and platinum or the Zen desktop right you will still get and there, there's a few other ones because there's cloud ones now too just to yeah. make it more complicated Sorry. but if yeah, no no worries <laughs> it's like it's not so easy um, but if you have that and you're on support um, you'll get it if you're not on platinum you'll get it for um, one th think of it as one type right so if you're using vSphere you can use everything in vSphere but then you can't use cloud too right so to be able to use more than one either hypervisor or cloud or, or what have you um, you need to be on Platinum, right? So that's kind of where we broke it. We're giving, we're giving you all the technology. We're just not letting you use it in as complex a way unless you're on Platinum. Okay. Um, which is better, right? Because I think there are more people probably that will use it on one platform who are not at Platinum than any other way to do that. Um, and then, of course, you can upgrade to Platinum if you do want to use on-prem and cloud or multiple hypervisor or would have kind of the so, portability method. So Rob, there, an app disk conversation keeps coming up in the question area, so we'll just address it right now. Citrix app disk was a technology Citrix evolved out of the uh, personal VDisk technology from uh, RingCube, uh, and that is being supplanted with Unidesk, right? App disk goes away, Unidesk becomes app the app. Disk and PVD will both go away eventually, right? Correct. Not immediately, but eventually. So if you're at the beginning of of doing this now, I, I would not use AppDisk or, or PVDisk. Yeah. Um, but if you already have it in place, you'll be able to use it for a while, and then you'll, have, you'll want to migrate off of it. This, this is a much better real solution than AppDisk. AppDisk was nice to have. It checked the box for Citrix, but this is a solution. 
to begin with before yeah, it's, it's very it. different you know i used to sell against aptos because i so i could go over all that but i think we want we want to show it not talk about what didn't work right in AppDisk, but um, yes, that you, you should be much more successful using this than than you would have been using AppDisk. Well, and then the one question that comes up here, which we should probably address on AppDisk, is what is? Do you have any idea what the end of life on App? If you have people out there using it, when do they need to make the cut over buy? Do you have any idea? Um, it'll be a year from when we announce the end of life, which we haven't done yet. So there's a while. Right now, okay. I, I I'm not the right person to answer that, even though I think I know when it is. But yeah, I, I believe I want to go at it. I believe it's end of sale. It was announced when when we released uh, 4.1 that went end of sale. So if you didn't already have the solution, you weren't already using it, um, it's end of sale. It did announce, I believe it did in the in the release, give uh, um, actual end of support dates, but I, I don't remember the exact ones. Okay. Um, so you can look. I, I, I think it would have been 18 months from when that was then, but it's it's not immediate for sure. Um, okay. Any others or? Yeah. Here's a question for you, Rob. Um, how does it differ from containers? Um, the, I mean, what, what we're doing here is, and, and I'm not an expert on containers, but, but what we're doing here um, really is we're capturing the file system, we're capturing the registry, and we're putting them back together on the machine to make it look like uh, a single machine. We're not isolating anything. We're not putting up walls to, to stop things from working. There's no micro anything going on. So um, from my understanding of, of containers, it, it's slightly similar, but totally different in its implementation. And of course, it's nothing to do with any of the standards around containers, right? This is totally a proprietary technology that, that Citrix bought that Unidus created. Hey. I think this is a question that comes up, uh, you know, pretty frequently. You know how we compete with ad volume, and uh, yeah, I, I guess the the first thing that I would say is that, um, um, and and Rob will have you elaborate after. But uh, initially, uh, I look at like the elastic assignment as being the mo just that piece being similar to ad volumes. With with a few exceptions to that, that is that we can do an assignment by user or by AD group instead of an assignment to a machine. That's the first difference. The second thing is everything that we're talking about about layer assignment is something that App Volumes doesn't do. So, if you want to deliver antivirus, you want to deliver um, you know anything that's a deep rooted like filter driver type based application. Um, you're not going to be able to deliver it in a layer um, with with uh, VMware, whereas with uh, app layering, you're going to be able to put it in a layer and assign it. Uh, so you don't have to crack open that gold image every time. Yeah, I think you know there's some significant differences. The, the elastic layering is is most similar to what App Volumes does. Um, which is a you know the the dynamic piece and, and it's a virtualized registry along with a virtualized file system. So those are are relatively similar. Um, the the huge difference here is that we're managing the image as well, right? Which you don't get at all with link clones. And we're making it so that you have single instance management. So if I end up you know if I have a complex environment with 40 different use cases and 27 of them they all get Office, right? And I need to build in the, the VMware case, 40 something images to manage that. For us, you build one office layer and you include it in an image template for, you know, might be 40 of your images, but you don't have to manage them separately 40 times, right? And that's the big deal here is that the whole layered image thing is still layered, not just the dynamic application layer piece. Plus, you don't have to learn totally different technologies to manage the image from managing the rest of the layers. There's a lot of other things. There's maturity. There's the way that we merge in um, drivers and things. Um, if you put drivers, let's say you have third-party drivers that are not kernel drivers and you want to include them in app volumes, you have to put them all in the same layer they would break, right? For us, we actually recreate the driver store in Windows from different layers so that all the drivers see each other. Right and work. None of that happens on on the VMware side. I, I don't want to go too in, in depth here because this is about the POC for the the sales piece of why not app items or whatever. Um, but leave it to say this is the Unidesk uh, has been doing this for 10 years. Right, app items was a much newer company. We have a lot more maturity baked into the product. That's really kind of what it comes down to. Yeah. 
Hey, Rob, good question here from someone. They ask, um, if you had two versions of an app, let's say Java as an example, would your solution be able to help them have both versions of Java in the same image is the first question, and then, or not the same image, but available to the user or the, the VM itself, uh, and then could they run at the same time based on the isolation, isolation conversation from earlier? Right, so we don't isolate. So if you're talking VDI, right, you couldn't have the same user have two versions of Java on the same machine if, with stupid Java apps, which is really what the problem is with it working. We, we don't solve that problem. You'd have to use AppV or ThinApp or some other cloud apps or some other app virtualization product to actually make that work on top of what we do. If you had two different users on the same session host that used two different versions of Java and they were okay with that, right, just by the user, that would actually work on, say, on a session host, right? But it's not going to work um, otherwise or on VDI, right? That's not a problem we were solving. Yep. And, and one good thing to throw in from a good Citrix guy perspective, right? We still have Citrix application presentation, aka ZenApp, in our back pocket for, I mean, this isn't the only thing within Citrix now. It's We have options, and this is multiple options plus the app presentation, which would solve the Java need that we just discussed. Correct. And, you know, create a, a separate image for, what you need on a different Zen app silo and, and deliver it that way. Absolutely. That makes sense. Okay. Are we good? Yeah, we got a ton of questions, but you're never going to get through if we don't keep going. So keep going. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is a little bit of, Hey, what did we do last time? Right? Cause remember this is part two. So last time we actually, um, showed how you would download an appliance and install it. it. It's very easy. It's an OVF file, right? You're just installing a single appliance into your virtual infrastructure, whatever that infrastructure is. That part's easy, right? Um, pretty simple to configure. Again, go back and, and look at some of the things that are on the web for how to do that stuff. We're not going to go over that today. Um, you create a gold image, which we did, which is just creating um, a virtual machine in your hypervisor. In this stuff, you really want it to not be an image that you use for other things, right? Unless it's totally generic. We just want Windows in there and patches. We don't want anything else in there for the app layering to work right because you want to make it so that for any configuration you need, it'll be okay, right? So if you put applications in your gold image that become part of your OS layer, then you're, you already have those in there. You're not layering those, right? So ideally, just the OS goes into this um, gold image that we're going to use to create our OS layer. Then you download something we call Gold Image Tools. You unpack it, install some scripts and an installer. You run the installer. Um, you run a couple little utilities, and then that's all ready to import. You import that into Unidesk, and it becomes an OS layer. And I'm going to show you how to do that because it changed a little. You used to have to download an OVF to a share and then import from the, the disk file that creates. Now we just pull it right out of the hypervisor, so you don't have to do that anymore. That's easier. Okay. You do need Active Directory set up in your lab. It has to be part of what you're doing. Uh, permissions defined and accounts for to, to use your infrastructure. Firewall ports created if you have any firewalls between the appliance and, and the other machines. Um, and then, you know, you create an OS layer. We, as part of that part one, had an OS layer. We created an MCS platform layer. And a platform layer, and go into a lot of detail, show it. That's where we install the drivers for a particular platform. Remember, we said I could, for instance, have PVS and MCS and link clones all at the same time in my environment. In fact, in my lab, I do. So you need a platform layer for PVS. That includes, you know, you put the PVS tools in there, your VDA, any other things that really are integrated with the VDA go into that platform layer. And then when I publish the PVS, I choose that platform layer, it adds those drivers for me. If I push into MCS, right, I have an MCS platform layer. All I have in that is the VDA, actually. When I push to MCS, it includes those drivers, but not the PVS ones. So the platform layer gives us the ability to have specific drivers for whatever platform that we're pushing to. So in that last session, we created an MCS platform layer, created an image template, published to MCS, and then we tested, right? That's kind of what we did in part one here. Um, if you are testing, right, the things you can test with now, you can test with Zen Server, vSphere, Hyper-V, Nutanix, AHV, and Azure, right? You could test with AWS, it's a little manual, right? And actually right now, Hyper-V is a little manual too. We're working on a Hyper-V connector, which will automate um, 
the work, and I'll show you what connectors do when we do the, the PLC, but it automates kind of the talking to that host. So we don't have Hyper-V done. We're in the midst of doing it. It'll be out soon. Um, we also are going to do AWS. But that's not done either. But you could almost integrate anything by, by pushing images to a share and then yourself copying them into whatever platform you want them in. So it's possible to do. From a broker standpoint, if you're testing ZenApp, Zen Desktop, View, right? those are all supported and out of the box we have connectors for those. There aren't a lot of people that do anything else, but if you had something else, you could manually integrate it. You'd be able to do that um, as part of it. Provisioning solutions, PBS, MCS, View Composure, and Azure. And again, if you want to do AWS or something else, you can do it manually. right? Um, you don't need 10 gig networking. I don't have it in my lab, but it's a lot better if you do have it. And for production, it's required right? for, for the way it works. Um, flash or hybrid storage, these are big files. right? This is VDI um, and virtual session. You do need fast storage or the users won't be happy. Right? So that's kind of a requirement. And then if you're going to use the elastic layering and test it, you need a SIF share and SMB3 is preferred. Of course, if you're using a technology that can use that Windows 7, you don't need SMB3. So today, what are we going to do? All right, we're going to create a platform layer for PVS, right, where we configure a hypervisor connector, install PVS tools, install the broker, and join the domain. While that's finishing up, right, we're going to, or actually while we're creating the thing to do that, we're going to install, the, I said we had an agent for PVS. We're going to install that. I'll show you how to install it. And we're going to configure PowerShell on the PVS server, which is not done right out of the box. So I'll show you where you find the directions for that and how to do that. When that's done, we'll create an application layer, right? It's a Notepad++ application layer. Then we'll create an image template and push that up into PVS. Um, we'll run the Zen Desktop Setup Wister to, to create some um, targets based on our image that we deploy. Um, that'll also put that into the DDC for us. Then we can log on and test, log out, assign the elastic layer, log in and test again. So that's what I hope to get done. We should have plenty of time. To do that. Okay. Yeah, and Rob, to be clear, I mean, some people are starting to complain there's too many questions. Guys, keep asking the questions, but yeah, people want to see it, so uh, let's let's try to do both yeah. if we can. Awesome. <laughs> we will. So um, one thing I wanted to show you before I hit the next thing is, is how, because we kind of went through it a little bit, how do I get the appliance? Um, if you already have this installed, you get upgrades from the Unidesk site still, right? You can go to Unidesk and download an upgrade from there, but you can't get the new software from Unidesk anymore, right? So now what you have to do is go to Citrix Cloud. Um, if you don't have a login, which a lot of people wouldn't, you can just request a trial login. You don't need to actually pay for Citrix Cloud. Um, when you get your trial logon and you log in, what you'll see, see how there's, I don't know if you can see here, there's app layering here. There's some other services in here. App layering, I've already done it, so it says manage, but it would say request trial like ShareFile does here. If you click request trial, um, put in your information, say OK, it'll actually go away and it'll be auto approved, right? It might take five minutes, right? But the system's going to actually approve it. You come back in here and it'll now say manage, right? When it says manage, you just click on manage and that goes into the Citrix cloud. Now, let's see if it makes me, you know. And it'll tell you information, right? There's a little bit of information about it. But if you click on getting started, that gives you the different downloads. So let's say if I wanted to download for Azure, I would click on Azure and it would give me that download. Um, in my environment, I've actually got Zen Server, Hyper-V, and VMware. I don't have Nutanix because I haven't set that up. Um, but if you want to do vSphere, you click on vSphere here. You can use a cloud connector if you want, right? A cloud connector would let you use a secure browser from Citrix Cloud to access your appliance, but you're installing the appliance on your site, so you don't need a cloud connector if you don't want to, just skip that. You can just go direct to download for vSphere, and it's gonna download um, the appliance OVA for you that you use to install, right? That's it, so really from a Citrix Cloud standpoint, all you're doing is downloading the software from here. Then you can go and do your POC from that, it's very easy, right? Um, hey, hey, Rob, can I bring something up? Someone mentioned how long it takes, and we experienced that last time on my little lab, how long it takes to actually create the uh, image, which in all honesty wasn't that bad um, on that environment. Uh, I don't remember what it was, maybe 10, 15 minutes, uh, I guess. I think that's what it was. Uh, Do you mean for that's, packaging, like when you're using it or when you're trying to install the appliance? 
trying to cre well no not the appliance install but at the actual creating of the package the layer yes right I mean you're going to see that now it depends on you how fast your lab is right if you're doing it in a slow lab with slow disk um, it can take 15 to 20 minutes to do things right um, yep. if you're doing it in a faster lab with kind of production level stuff you might be more like eight minutes to, to ten minutes to do things um, but you'll so would that be a reason would that be a reason to consider the Citrix cloud so you get the horsepower on the back end? It's well, we're, the only thing we're doing with Citrix cloud is giving you the ability to download it. Everything else is the same, so not yet, right? There's okay. no nothing faster yet. Yep. Um, okay. Eventually, we expect to split our appliance into two with the brain in Citrix cloud, so we can upgrade and do everything from the management side, and then you will have a local. Uh, on-prem appliance, um, but right now it's just giving you the ability to download the software. That's all that you're using Citrix Cloud for. Okay. Um, and I should say, up, I, I, that's not quite true. Once you install this, it will download upgrades automatically for you. So they'll get, they won't get installed, but they'll get, they'll, you'll automatically get them, and then I, it'll tell you that there's been an upgrade, and you decide when you want to do that upgrade. So that's one one of the big advantages of us putting it on the cloud was to, to do that process. Um, okay. And ha having the upgrade, it wouldn't cause any kind of downtime for anything, right? Correct. Remember, the appliance doesn't um, have anything to do with anything that's running in production, right? So whether you're upgrading it, rebooting it, doesn't matter. Um, and actually, we. If you do use elastic layering, we do have drivers in the images, um, but we automatically upgrade those the next time you publish, right? So we we will put the new drivers in the next time you publish a new image from that. Okay, so we're in here. We're in my appliance, which has been set up already, right? So we're not starting from scratch here. Um, I'll just give you kind of a couple highlights when you do install. When you install the appliance and you log in, you're not going to have things in here, but you're going to have this basic structure where there's an images tab, there's a layers tab where you define layers, users, and system. Right. So the first thing when you log in um, the first time, you click on system, there's a settings and configuration here, and there's a few settings in here that you can go through and look at. None of them are super critical. The first top of this is Unidesk Labs. That's where you would enable, for instance, the user layer, right? If you hey, want to do the user layer stuff, you'd enable that here. Yes. Hey, Rob, any any way you can uh, maximize your screen? We've got a couple of folks asking. Uh, it doesn't really make it bigger. So let me yeah, I know. do that because that'll make it actually a little bigger. That's better. Maximize it just gives you more of nothing. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it came through a lot better over the over the go to meeting, uh, and I think a lot of it's just GTM stuff. Um, well, no, it, it doesn't help that I have a 27 inch screen, right? So that <laughs> makes it look small. Oh, now okay. you're just bragging. Yeah, right. <laughs> I only have one though. You guys probably have five. All right. So if you come in here, you can turn on elastic layering, right? So if you click at it here, right, you come in here and check that box and click save, and that'll enable. Uh, the user layer, if you want to test that, and you have Windows 7 that you're doing. Remember, right now, if you're not doing Windows 7, don't turn that on. Um, soon to be Windows 10, right? You'll be able to do Windows 10. Session host not covered yet, so you can't do Zen app yet. We're in like 2012 R2, et cetera. If you want to change your certificate, you can do that in here. Here's where you define your network file share, right? So you click Edit in here. You type in your share, the permissions to get to, and say Test, um, and that should set that that up. Security settings here, that's a timeout, so I have mine set to zero, which means it doesn't time out. If you make it 15, it'll time out in 15 minutes. It's not a, it's not smart enough to know that you're using it. It's just from when you log in, how long until it times you out. So, you know, you might want to make it two or three hours or more, uh, however you want to do that. Um, the other things are about logging. We default keep logs for 180 days. Uh, we keep tasks for 30 days, and we'll clean those up after that. And if you want to put in a mail server to get notifications, there aren't a lot, but there's some. That's the kind of stuff that's in, in here. Um, if you turn on the user elastic layering, you'll see the storage locations, and that's where you define where the user layers get stored. So by default, there's only one location in here. We'll put both the user elastic layers and the app elastic layers in the same place. Um, obviously, the, the app elastic layers are 
reading, so you'd want a share that's optimized for read. Where the user ones are writing, you'd want it optimized for write, so you might want to create different ones. You can actually create as many user layer shares as you want. Um, they're assigned by group, so you'd create different Active Directory groups, and the user in that layer would go to that group, right? So you can have as many of those as you want. Um, and here you see manage appliances, which is funny, we only have one appliance, right? We used to have more. You'll see the amount of storage defined for your layer library, which is what this layering service is here. Um, you can expand that storage just by making the disk bigger. If you look at your appliance, there'll be two disks, a boot disk and, and a storage disk. If you make the storage disk, disk bigger on your hypervisor, you can then come back here and say expand and it'll let you make it bigger. You can also add disks and we'll combine them together if you want. Okay. Um, the next thing you would do is come and add your Active Directory domain into here, and we call it a directory junction, right? So you'd say, I want to create a directory junction and give it a name and address for your um, domain controller, right? And you can say test, and it helps if you put the IP address in right. And then you go through and then you put your account that you're going to attach as, et cetera. And basically you're configuring um, the root of one of your active directed domains. I have two in here so that I can authenticate against two different domains as a test. Okay. Um, you can then actually come in here and add users, right? And then you can make the users administrators or not by editing their, editing their properties, right? If you add a user in, then you can, we actually have a few different roles and some different parts of the rows that you can add in for them. But pretty simple to set this up, there's not that much to it. Once you set up the appliance, which that's all there is to that, then you'd come in here and say I want to create layers, and the first thing you would do is say I'm going to create an OS layer. Um, now I said before, remember you're going to create this gold image, you're going to uh, get Windows updates on it, you're going to install the Unidesk drivers, um, and then you just come here and say I want to create an OS layer and give it a name. You know, something like this is, if you were going to do Windows 7 x64, you want something in the name that's going to tell you the differentiate between the others if you're doing 32 and 64. Of course, if you're only doing one of Windows 7, you don't need to put that complexity in it. Um, going to do a version, and for versions and all of this stuff, I always use a standard that's a number, so I get accounting, and then the date that you do it so you know when you did it. So I would do, and this is just a text field, so you can use whatever format you want. Um, for that. Max layer size, you want to make big enough that you're sure your image will fit, right? So I think, you know, I think 40 would be big enough for a Win 7 layer. Um, here's where you have, we talked about connectors, and you have to have a, a connector that's going to talk to the environment, and I'm doing everything in vSphere today, so you'll see a lot of the things I have say vSphere on them. If I show you a connector, which I'll do, I'll click edit here, it's going to bring up my connector UI. And what you'll see here is it has a name at the top. That's almost the hardest thing to see because it's at the top there. Sometimes you miss it, but you want to type a name in there. Um, it has the credentials, in this case a vCenter server, the name and password that you want to connect with that. You have to fill that stuff out and say click check credentials first, and then that will actually let you pick your data center, um, your ESX host and storage, et cetera, of where you're going to interface. Notice this, this is a really interesting feature. If you do want to speed this up and you're on vSphere, we have something called a layer disk cache. And what we'll do that there is after we build install machines, we call them, but machines that boot that you do packaging on, we'll actually leave the disks for those machines up in vSphere so that the next time that you build one that looks the same, we just clone it in vSphere rather than going through the whole process we use to spin one up. Right. So this speeds up. You can get install machines then usually in about five to ten minutes, as opposed to you know ten to twenty minutes for, for that. Okay. I'm going to close this because I'd already have one. Um, then you select a virtual machine. Remember what we're doing here? We're importing that VM that was our gold image. Right. So you just go out here, and this is what's different from the first session. If you look at the video for the first session, what we would say is you would have transferred a file to a share. Here we're just going to go and pick the actual VM that we want, right? And this will show you all the VMs. You can just pick the one 
that you're trying to import, right? Again, I'm not going to do this, but it's very easy. Then we just pull it in and that becomes an OS layer, right? So when you're done, you have an object like this for the particular OS layer. And we're actually going to be using this one today, this one 764 one. If I pick the options on that, what you'll see in there is I have one version here because I try to keep it, it slim. Um, and you can see my Windows OS layer is 18 gigabytes, right? And I have enough room to grow that to 40 over time kind of thing. Um, and I use it in a bunch of different templates, right, is what that's part of. What happens if you make the mistake of creating like a platform or app layer that's larger than your OS layer? Well, once we actually, on the, those other layers, once we capture them, when we store them, they're actually stored as the size of the files, so it wouldn't matter. Unless I misunderstood your your question. I, I meant like if you have your OS layer set at 40 gigs, and then you have a platform layer, and you set it at 50, and then you have an app layer that you set at like 80. Would that cause any issues? No. no they, I mean, they are what they are. It doesn't matter. When we put them together, you know, when you actually use them and you push up an image, that has a separate size, right? So here's where I define an image for when I put it all together. And you do have to define a size in here. You just have to make sure that's big enough to handle all the layers that you put in them. But it doesn't need to be, um, let me find that here. It doesn't need to be bigger. It, it only needs to be bigger with the space that's actually used, right? Not with the space that's just there left extra for growth. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Um, so here's where, you know, if I'm publishing an image and it, I really needed 50 gig, but I only have 30, it would go to publish it, you'd get an error because it didn't have enough room to write all the, the files into it. Okay. Um, so back here to platform layer, and I'm actually, the first thing we're going to do uh, in our session here is create a platform layer. Now, of course, you'll see here, you know, I have a platform layer for view for Windows 7, right? I have a separate one for instant clones for Windows 10, and that's because it's a different agent, right? RDSA, so all different kinds of things. Here's one for MCS with 7.12. I have a PVS 7.8 with a VDA of 7.11. You know, you can have lots of different versions. The cool thing here, let's say I started with 7.6, right? And I had a PVS uh, platform layer that was PVS provisioning services 7.6 and the VDA was 7.6. And then I decide to upgrade both of those to 7.12. All I have to do is create a new platform layer, include 7.12 of both of them, and the next time I publish, I use the new platform layer, I've upgraded. Right? There's no reverse imaging, none of that. It, it, it's a really simple process. VMware Tools in my, in, is in your OS layer. If you want to upgrade VMware Tools, you also don't have to do any reverse imaging. You just create a new version of your OS layer, upgrade VMware tools in it, and the next time you publish, you use that, and you've upgraded VMware tools. So let's go here and say we're going to... Could you put tools in the platform layer so that you could use the same OS for, for Zen Server, uh, vSphere? And... You can anyway, because we do this scrubbing thing, right? So so you wouldn't need VMware tools in your platform layer if your if you're Elm is on VMware. However, you might need, you know, Zen server tools in your Zen server platform layer so that when you push it out to Zen server, it has the right tools. Um, we will remove, we, we do a scrubbing thing. So when you go from one hypervisor to another, we remove things that don't need to be there and we'll take out some of the VMware tools. But you do need to get the Zen tools in there. So you have to make sure those are in the Zen platform layer. Um, if, you're high, if your Elm was on Zen, then you wouldn't include the Zen tools in the platform layer for Zen, but if you were going to push it back to ESX, then you'd want the VMware tools ones in the VMware platform layer. So kind of yes and no for, to, to your answer. All right, so let's call this a POC platform layer, and I'm actually going to do 7.12 stuff because that's what my environment is. Um, I'm going to say it's the 1.0 from today. Um, it's not, th this is a, for apps is 10 gig. I usually leave it 10 gig unless I know it needs to be bigger. Like for Office, you should make it 20 gig, right? Because that can grow over time to be pretty big. But 10 gig is plenty big enough for most things. We're going to do Windows 7. Okay. Um, I actually already have a vSphere connector that's configured for Windows 7. Now here's what's different. The reason I have a, 
separate one here from that vSphere connector as I'll show you. In the vSphere connector, you can include a template and it'll configure the systems like that template. So I've created a Windows 7 template with the right number of processors and memory that I want when I do these install machines. And I have a connector that has just those settings, right? So that's why there's one that's specifically here for, for Windows 7. Don't have to use it. I could use this one. It's just it's going to make my virtual machine have four processors and 8 gig of RAM because it thinks it's like a, a Zen app machine. So I'm going to use this instead. Okay. Now, when you first come into this, you won't really have anything but the network connector in here, and you don't want to use that. What you want to do is click New. Right, and this sometimes gets people. Then you want to pick what kind of one am I creating. So I'm using vSphere or I'm using Zen Server or whatever it is. So let's say vSphere and then say new again. And that will bring you into this UI where you create a new connector. Just remember the names up here. I always forget that. It's a little hard to see up there. Okay. All right. So we're going to use this one. Um, we're creating what's called a publishing platform layer. Um, almost all the time when you create a platform layer, it's for publishing, right? The only reason we have another option here, which is a platform layer for creating and updating layers. Um, generally, the only reason you use that one is if you need a driver from your tools to do packaging. So let's say you need a USB driver from the VDA because you're going to include a scanner and it has to see the scanner, something like that. I've never actually used this packaging. You almost always just want to make this type of platform layer. So we're doing vSphere with PVS on Zen Desktop, right? These are used, remember I said we do scrubbing? These are used to know how to do the scrubbing. So it's important when you create a platform layer to get these right, right? The hypervisor provisioning service in the broker. Okay. You can change the layer. It's going to have this particular disk name. I always leave that the same um, as part of that. You is, there a difference a if you want. is there a difference between Zen App and Zen Desktop as far as that goes? There is. Use Zen App if it's a server OS and Zen Desktop if it's um, a desktop OS, separate so from whatever you licensed. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can have a different icon. Right? I'm just going to use the standard Citrix icon here. Uh, icons, you can use kind of any JPEG or PNG. I always just go try to find a... Um, transparent PNG, they look the best right, for when you go try to use them. Okay. Actually, you know what? Let's use this one to differentiate it for POC. Then say create. Okay. Now, what that's actually going to do, and it is going to take a little time, is it's going to um, take our OS layer, right? It's going to clone it. And we store everything in our store as a VHD file. But of course, I'm using vSphere, so in the end, it has to end up as a VMDK that we create VMs out of. So if you look in our task manager, and by the way, at the bottom here, you see the sergeant stripes. If I click on that, it opens our task manager. If I click anywhere in these tasks, it'll get rid of the done and old ones. So I'm going to do that. That cleans things up. Right? And then here's our task we just started. I'm going to double click on that, and it's going to tell me what it's doing. So right now, it's... Remember I said we do the caching? It's deploying the packaging disk from cache. It's doing it kind of the fast way. If it, What it normally would do is it would take the VHD in our library and it would clone it first as a VHD. It would then convert that to a VMDK, and then it would push that as an OVF file up into vSphere. Um, we do that actually thin as a sparse file, but the format vSphere doesn't like, so it actually has to make it thick. So it's going to go... Th Normally, it would go through this whole process to get it into vSphere Expanded where you could use it, and that does take a while. That's why the caching is so nice, because it's really just going to clone the disk that I've already done that to up in vSphere, so it'll be a lot quicker. Okay. So while that cooks away, though, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the uh, second PBS server that I have, and I'm going to show you how to install our PBS agent and how you would configure PowerShell. Right. So why I'm doing this, if there's any other questions we can answer, we can jump to that, too. All right. Um, so I have a PBS server here, right? And the first thing I need to do is, you know, I'll just show you that. Go into Control Panel and Programs. There's no um, Unidesk or Citrix agent in here um, that would be installed as part of that. So I want to install that. So I'm going to go to my file server.
Hey, hey guys, just right. so just so you know, there's at least one or a couple of people who have complained about the uh, screen freezing. I haven't seen Rob's screen freeze at all, so you know, chances are it's on your end, not not Rob's end. Not that that's never happened, but luckily today. <laughs> I just I I love how some people yeah. always assume it's the other person's fault, and they and they go to meeting. You know, it could right. be your side that's the problem. <laughs> uh, actually, that's not what I want. Let's see. All right, so when you download um, our appliances, right, what you're going to get is kind of a zip file. When you unzip that zip file, there'll be these files in it, right? So um, one's called Gold Image Tools. That's the thing that you install into the Gold Image, right, and put all the scripts on there and our drivers, right? You'll also get the OVA, right, for installing your appliance, right? We've already done that stuff. But one thing that you get there is this app layering agent installer. That's the PVS. Agent. I don't know why we don't have PVS, and I guess you could theoretically use this to run scripts and other things, but I'm just going to copy that to my PVS server and run it. And it's going to come up and it's going to actually ask me for the address of our appliance because it's going to register with the appliance. Okay. So does this require the MCLI to be installed? Um, it doesn't to install, but it does to work, absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to show that in, in a second because um, what we're actually doing is we use PowerShell to do everything and what this agent really is is a PowerShell proxy so that we can safely and securely do PowerShell commands from the appliance on, on this box. Hey, Rob, there's a question here that says, what are my options with just V? CD access, not vSphere. Does that make sense to you? No, I don't know what vCD means. Yeah. So if you ask that question, if you could elaborate. So I'm getting the IP address of my appliance because I forgot what it is. Right. So it's 242. Okay. So the the question about vCD is is very valid one, and I think it's going to come up a lot for people who are using. Uh, infrastructure as a service, either their own or someone else's. Uh, what he was referring to there is uh, vCloud Director, which is the VMware cloud management layer platform for ESX and maybe other things. But in that case, uh, uh, the user, the organization, would not have access to vCenter and vSphere. They would have access to vCloud Director. Uh, have you run across that? Right. So we don't support VMware's cloud yet. Right. So you wouldn't be able to use this in that. Um, and the question wasn't specifically VMware's cloud, but their VMware management platform for creating your own cloud, potentially. Right. That it doesn't matter. We don't have integration yet with with anything yeah. that's vSphere except vCenter. Okay. Which is the predominant way of doing um, it? But now you could you run... again remember we can manually put images onto shares, and you can use that to both create installer machines and do that. But there'd be a bunch of manual work, so you could get it to work, um, but it's we don't have any automation for that and nor do I know of anybody that's tried it okay um, so a couple things here it's asking you for the address of your appliance right that's the ELM appliance that you installed it's asking you for the uh, a user on the appliance so it can register right so that's what this is so I'm going to just use my local administrator on my appliance. I think if I can remember the password. Okay. Um, so that now registered with the appliance. That's the first thing I have to do. Then I'm going to open my little cheat sheet here, and I'm going to show you if what, what I usually do to try to figure this out, just to, to see, is I open a browser. And I actually Google Unidesk PVS agent um, I think that's probably enough. Let's see what I got. And I think the first hit that comes up is install the Unidesk agent. And that actually gives you the directions of what you need to do if you come down here um, on the PVS server, right? So if you um, click into here, you'll see it says if you're using PVS 
7.6 or below, right? You want to run this. If you're using 7.7 or above, you want to run that. Now I copied that into here, right? So I can just do it easily. First thing is CD to your provisioning services console, right? So you're going to open a, an administrative command prompt and execute that so that you're in the console there. And then copy this path, which is and this is not, this is just PVS stuff, right? The, it's installing the PowerShell for PVS configured. So this is Windows Microsoft.NET Framework 64 v4 install UI and then the snap in ID. I'm just going to paste that in here. And it should say um, phase completed successfully and that it installed, right? Then if you want to test it, what you can do is open up an administrative PowerShell prompt. and load the snap-in, right, so NPS snap-in citrix.pvs.snap-in okay. and then you can just do something like get PVS collection I think it is and you should get a response if it's working assuming you have collections you've gotten that far Right. You can also do something, I think, get PVS site, which will tell you if you have a site configured. Okay. Then you know at least the PowerShell is working, if that all works. Okay. Hey, Rob, one of the things that came up last time was a uh, official training class from Citrix. Do you know where that stands? Uh, I don't. I know that we just created a hands-on lab for this and that's going to be rolled out at Synergy and a couple places around the country are using it and I assume there'll be more access to that. Um, I thought I saw, Rob, did you say, I thought I saw that there, with as part of a bigger class they were including app layering, but, but I'm not positive. Rob is having trouble getting unmuted um, oh, okay. and I can't unmute him myself so I'm not sure what's happening. I'll keep trying. Okay, so he might know something but I don't really know. Um, I suppose if you, if you go look at the training site, you can see too. I apologize for not knowing that. Um, that's it. So this is now kind of configured. If we look at at this after installing the agent, you should see that there's a uh, Citrix app layering agent. That's what we just installed. These do need upgrading. You know, when new versions come out, you know, if they have any changes, and you would just basically download that XC and rerun the installer, and it would upgrade it as part of that. Um, if you are using an older version, you know, if you're using a before 4.1 version and you're upgrading, you'll want to come in here and uninstall the old version and reinstall the new one because we changed it to be Citrix from Unidesk. Otherwise, you'd have two, right? and that would be a problem. Okay. Um, so back to here. Let's see where we are with our spinning up our machine. It's, it's Right now, it's powering on the platform layer installer machine. So if we come into here, and I apologize, I can't really make this one bigger, really. Um, what we do with install machines, if you look, and it's a little hard to read for you guys probably, but there's a folder that I set in my, uh, in my connector that I would put things under. Under that, we create a packaging VMs folder, and under that, we actually put the packaging VMs. So it's now spinning up one called POC platform layer, because that's what I called my layer. Um, Remember, we're going to dynamically create that installer machine for you, so all you have to do is use it, right? So I can actually come here and just open the console for this and do my install of the platform layer. Uh, and remember what the platform layer was. We're going to install PVS tools. We're going to optimize them. We're going to install the VDA, and we're going to join the domain. That's what we're going to do in here. So I'm just going to log in. Now, this is not part of the domain, so when you're logging in, you're logging in as whatever the local administrator account you enabled on your gold image. Um, I'm going to connect. It's trying to reboot there because the disk changed a little, and so did processors for this, so it wants to reboot it. We'll get that reboot in part of what we do. I'm going to go uh, attach the provisioning services software. Right? And let's see if I can find the right one. Seven thirteen. I want seven twelve. Hold on. There it is. Seven twelve. 
And then that should come up in here. Again, nothing terribly hard here. I'm going to do the device installation. This is not so exciting, so if there's any questions you guys want to ask why we <laughs> click through this, we can. Yeah, so one question just came in. Easy one. Is it being recorded? Yes, this is being recorded. Okay. If I just wanted to use this like a, a base image creation tool, could I like create the image, put it into PBS, and then go from there just using PBS layering or uh, their versioning? After you create, you know, after you push up the image, yeah, you can do whatever you want. And it's just a normal V-disk, assuming, um, well, yeah, actually, either way, right? You, you absolutely can boot that into private mode, make changes to it. You can do what you want. Uh, I publish scripts that if you have a process you need to run that you want to script, we can actually publish, and the connector will call a script. So, so for one customer that had to run a, a Symantec utility on their image, we actually had it where it pushed it up started it up, it ran that script automatically and shut it down and then finalized it in PBS and that was all automated. Cool. I also have scripts. We, we publish things as VHDs into PBS. I have scripts if you really want it to be VHDX that'll help you convert it to a VHDX and re-add it back into the PBS console. Um, so lots of different things you can do if you're into PowerShell. Okay, so we installed the PBS tools. We're going to run that uh, PBS optimizer so we don't forget. The, the good thing about this is that it does things um, that are important, like disabling um, password updates between the, the disk image and Windows so that PBS can do that instead. Otherwise, they get out of whack and you might have problems. A um, couple interesting things I, I have seen lately on the forum. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and run this. It also runs NGEN if it needs to run. Uh, one interesting thing was somebody installed a newer version of um, PVS device um, tools in their layer than they had on their server, and it stopped the machine from being um, joined in Active Directory so they couldn't log in as a domain user. As soon as they went to the right version, it worked okay. So be aware of that one, right, if you're kind of up um, – loading and using a newer version, you might have an issue. I didn't see that from 7.12 to 7.13, for instance. I was able to do that one, but maybe they had 7.6 on the server and they were trying to do 7.13 in the, the layers. Okay, so... Typically, when you're doing an upgrade of uh, PBS, you want to do the servers first and then the VDA. The agent, yep. So I'm going to disconnect that image and now join, get the VDA. Again, try to get the 7.12 version. So you want to create a master image if you want receive or not, it's up to you. All right, do you want to add in your DDC? Um, I always use optimized performance. Pick whichever of these you want to include. Uh, obviously, don't include personal VDS. Personal VDS will not work with app layering, so if you still need to use it, you don't want to do this stuff, right? You you, you want to keep doing it the old way until you're ready to go off it. Um, app v publishing components is a little complicated. There's some forum posts if you want to go read those on that, but they, they do install a local user. So if you're using the app v integration, if you just want to use app v separate, you don't have to worry about this, but if you're trying to use the app v integration with Citrix, um, it creates a local user and it sets up a com object for that local user. Um, if you do that, you want to go 
change the password or change the user so you know what the password is because you have to actually deploy local accounts using a GPP. If we save local accounts during this install in a platform layer, they're not going to get to the machine, right? We, we don't take the SAM database, which is the, the security um, accounts database in Windows and merge that. So you get the SAM database from the OS layer. So for instance, here when you join the domain, it would add um, domain admins into local administrators and domain users into local users. You need to do that separately with a GPP or a GPO. It's not going to happen automatically from the layering. Right? Uh, I'm not going to do either of those for this today. I'm just going to do the install. Any other questions we can answer why this, this does take a little while? So I think you, you might have covered this already, but are, are there plans to make it so the VTX, VTX can be created as a VHDX or just converted? I, I think we will do it when we can. The, the technology that we use to create the, um, the VHDs from our appliance um, the VHDX is it created weren't working correctly, so I think we either need to, it's open source, we either need to extend that ourselves or hope that they fix it, right, but we'd, we would like it to be able to do VHDX files, we just haven't gotten there yet. Um, in my utility that I used, I used a separate free kind of open source thing um, that you can, you, you would download and install yourself, that one, one company compiled that made it easy. Hey guys, I'm assuming there'll be a Unidesk lab at Synergy and post Synergy you'll be able to get access to it. Um, there, there is an app layering lab at Synergy except you won't be able to get access, it's all filled up. Um, but um, I post Synergy since, since they, they worked out how to do all that, I'm sure it'll be available however the labs are usually available. Yeah, I just happen to know somebody might be able to help with that. <laughs> um, we did test it for Jeff, who who created the whole thing, and it works pretty well. Performance is, is pretty good. I know Rob was just on a session with a bunch of partners last week that were using it, and I think everybody pretty much likes the, the lab. Yeah, it seemed like uh, everybody was able to get through the labs, um, and uh, it, it was pretty beneficial. It was kind of based on the same thing you're 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 going through, so PBS uh, architecture. Yeah. Um, now, if you have the time to do this in your own lab from scratch, you'll learn more because you'll have every piece of it. That lab has, in order for for it to work out time wise, of course, has some of the stuff done already. I see the, the question popping up quite often, uh, you know, as far as like VMware tools and, and joining the domain, do you, do you always do that in the uh, platform layer or is there any case where you'd really want to do it in the, the OS layer? Or do you, you always want to do it in the platform layer. That, that way that you can keep it separate and like say I got the OS layer and then I want to move to uh, Hyper-V or I want to move to ESX, I can easily just change the platform layer and suddenly I'm on the new new platform. Yeah, and that's not the reason we do the platform layer. The platform layer is at the top of the priority list when you create an image, right? So it's the thing that comes last, so it, it overrides it. The reason we don't want it in the OS layer is we actually, um, there's trust information that gets captured and it gets captured differently in the OS layer because we don't have a filter driver running. So if you put, if you join the domain in the OS layer, which, you know, maybe you might have to do because Really, on an install machine, you might have to do it because because you have an app that requires it be in the domain to set privileges or something. You just want to make sure that on that you can join that install machine to the OS to the domain, but you want to remove it before you're done because we don't want to capture the trust information in the OS layer. We handle the platform layer a little different, so it's okay. In fact, that's the reason we're joining in the platform layers to get that registry set up right. But, um, yeah, definitely in the platform layer. Uh, we don't want to do call home.
So this will reboot. Now, one thing about layering when you're in these install machines, when it asks you to reboot, go ahead and do it, right? Because it's trying to run a process on, on boot. It's trying to free up resources so it can do that. I always like to reboot one more time than it says. Um, but our we have a process in here when you're done where you say you're going to shut down to finalize. We will check to see if there's a pending reboot. So as long as they put the, their request for a reboot in the right place, we will tell you that and you'll reboot you know, appropriately. But you don't want to really do spend all this time do layering and then when you deploy it, have it say it needs to restart because there was a pending reboot. And Rob, don't don't feel bad about having to fill every moment with, with chatter, right? I mean, hopefully the intent was clear. This is kind of an online lab proof of concept, so you know, it takes time to do a few things. Hey, Andy, don't take the pressure off of it. <laughs> I could just I could just feel him kind of boiling, just sitting there, you know, thinking what what can I do to fill the time? I have that same situation happen all the time. Hey, one 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 thing worth mentioning um, when you're creating um, layers, um, something you'll see um, a lot of times uh, in production in POC whatever <clears throat> is you'll see activation errors, uh, whether for Office or for for the OS, usually OS activation. That's that's fairly normal, right? We're trying to, you know, it, it could be trying to talk to KMS, and it's not a member of the domain. So, seeing those types of uh, uh, alarms, you know, when you're, you know, when you're creating layers, just just keep in mind that'd be pretty normal. Yeah. So there's two different things there. One is when it tells you it's non-genuine. So that's actually okay if you're creating an install machine for an app layer or the platform layer, and that comes up and it says it's non-genuine. You don't have to activate that layer. You don't have to worry about that. However, in the OS layer, if you're adding a version to the OS layer itself, that you'd like to be activated. So if that one comes up non-genuine, I'll show you uh, in a second where you can fix that. We have some scripts that will um, put in a KMS key and activate for you. But you do want to go ahead and do that because you want the OS layer to be activated. That way you're more likely when you create the install machines for them to be OK. Right. Uh, Windows has this whole process that goes through software protection platform process where they're really just trying to see if you're stealing their licenses. And if the hard drive changes too much or the memory or it's got this 20 point scale and if all these things change too much, it decides that. Um, now, remember, I just joined the domain. That's why it, it changed there. Um, it decides that it thinks you stole the operating system and gives you that black screen and, and all that. That happens more in layering than otherwise because we changed up a lot, right? So. Uh, on regular machines, we activate every boot, right? So you don't see it and the users won't see it. But installer machines, we don't do that each time, so you might get the black screen to come up. So this is actually done. This thing's ready to, to be finished. We, uh, just to recap, we installed the device tools for PBS. We ran the optimizer to configure the settings that PBS likes, including, you know, shutting down um, password sync for the trust, uh, running NGEN and those types of things as part of that. We then booted up and installed the VDA, right? In fact, I should um, disconnect this, right? So we don't have the drive. Wouldn't matter, but I'll do it anyway. Um, and then we joined the domain. And you could join the domain at the beginning or at the end. It doesn't really matter, right? As long as the platform layer is joined to the main when you were done. Um, let me show you that activation stuff real quick, though, since Rob brought it up. And it is something that's important. So. Um, there's a folder under Windows Setup Scripts where we put a lot of scripts. Okay, and you'll see here when normally when you create your OS layer, you'll come in here and here's where you'll run the installer for for the app layering device drivers and stuff. Um, if you go into this KMS Dir folder, there's a whole set of activation scripts for each version of Windows. So if you do get in your OS layer where it says that it's non-genuine, you can just come in here, find your version of Windows. So, we're, you know, right now we're doing Windows 7 Enterprise. I would find that. Right-click, run as administrator. It should activate it because it puts the product key in and then it activates Windows. And then, um, but I would only do that in the OS layer. Okay. So here our platform layer is done. When you're done packaging here, there's a shutdown for finalize. You have to do this. If you don't click on this and have it shut down and then you bring the disk down will actually t give you an error and say you got to go do that, right? Because it does some stuff and it does some checks. This will actually check when I run it to see if NGEN has anything in the queue, which is the .NET um, compiler. It'll check to make sure that uh, the system doesn't need a reboot and isn't waiting for a reboot, right? It'll also um, 
the newest version of this removes ghost NICs as well, which can be a problem with VMX net drivers. So it'll actually go and remove the ghost NICs if there are any in there. Once this machine is actually shut down, right, which will hopefully be quick, you come back to the console. Um, and I didn't show you this before, but when this came up, it said your package machine was ready. It gave you the name of it and said, hey, go. So that also, if you're using the web, which I don't, uh, the web vCenter actually gives you a link to that so you can open the console directly from here. Um, but I'm going to click on our platform layer and say finalize here. And that's going to kick off the process to pull that disk back down into our appliance and make it ready for us to use. Um, now the next thing we wanted to do there is wanted to show you creating just a normal app layer. Uh, I wanted to save some time though. So what I did was I actually spun up the install machine for this app layer. So it's the same kind of thing. Normally you would say, I want to create an app layer. You'd give it a name. You'd give it your versioning, the biggest that you want the disk to be. You pick the operating system you want to package on. So if I'm doing Windows 7, I would pick that. Now it's really important to realize we tie the layers to the actual operating system because they go together. Because when you install an application, it remembers things about the operating system, like short folder names, GUIDs, um, folder paths, that kind of thing. So we make sure they're married together. That way you have the best success you're going to have with your application. Some of the other guys that do layering don't require you to keep those things together. You might have even packaged on a totally different OS than the one you're deploying on. You're going to have problems if you do that, right? So we don't want you to have problems. We don't let you actually do that. This is kind of cool if you do packaging a lot. We have the idea of a prerequisite layer. That lets me pick any layer in my library and put it on my installer machine. That's all it's doing. It's putting that layer on the installer machine. But say I'm doing an Office add-in. I've already developed Office. I just have to pick my Office layer, and it'll put it on there. That means I don't have to take an installer machine, snapshot it, install Office, and do all that stuff. Right? Could you show the different versions of like the OS layers? And there you go. Sure. Sure. So this shows versions, right? So if I have two versions of Office, I can pick which one I want on there. If I just take the top, it takes the latest. But let's say we didn't test that one, so I don't want to use that one, right? I could pick this one. Right? Same thing up here, right? If you have different versions, same idea. If you take the top one, it takes the latest. Otherwise, if you dig into it and you take the other one, you'll get that one. Right? Uh, we're not actually doing this, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, you pick your connector. And here's where it says, do you want a platform layer? Um, but remember, this is a packaging platform layer, right? So you could pick that, but I don't have any of those because I don't use it. Um, then you'd say create, and that would go through the process like it did with our platform layer of creating the install machine for that. Now, again, I cheated, right? We already have one running, so I'm just going to come over here and start this up. It would normally be running, right? You would just log into it. Since I made it yesterday, I didn't want it just capturing all night, right? So I shut it down. Um, and that's a little trick. If you do spin up installer machines and you're going to go use them the next day, shut them down so they're not just sitting there capturing whatever's written. When that install machine's running, we're, we're capturing whatever is being written to the disk into the layer. Right. Okay, so I'm going to open the console here. You know, and this one is just for an application, so I'm just going to do a simple Notepad++ app. But again, it's just running whenever you install. You can click on an MSI and install it. You can run an XC. One thing to remember, though, is we are capturing at a block level whatever changes. So ideally, you're going to run installs off the network and not have something like a zipped up XE where you copy it locally, then unpack it locally, then run it, because your layer is going to be a lot bigger if you do that than if you can run it a little more simply off the network. One thing about layers or, you know, any of this stuff, just like if you were installing on an image, you try to figure out how to disable auto updaters, right, and get them not to, to work. Actually, with Notepad++, this doesn't really work, but it'd be nice if it did. This actually is asking me, do I want to put it in the profile or not? I don't, so I'm going to check that. All right, finish, close. 
Now, the other thing, if you change a registry setting that's in anything but HK current user, that will stick with the layer. If you change something in HK current user, it'll only be in the admin profile and it'll never really make it to your user, right? You can't change user settings in a layer. That's not going to make it through. Anything you want to do for a user, you should do a GPO, a GPP, or a script to get that done or something in a profile manager or if you're using WEM with Citrix that actually works pretty well um, but it's not going to capture user settings in a layer. Right. Uh, that's done we're ready I'm just going to shut it down. And what you'll see when these things are done it'll actually clean up those installer machines I don't know if um, you can see that, but the, we before we had the installer machine there for the platform layer, that's gone now because the platform layer is done. Right? So if I look in here, it tells me the platform layer is done and I can actually use it. And this one's ready to go. Okay. Um, Performance-wise, I think I will finalize this layer now. We'll let that one cook while we do the next step. Okay. Notice when I finalize here, there's a script path. It's kind of a cool thing. If I put in my layer, if I, in a folder, create a script that I need, um, if I put that script path here, when this layer gets applied, whether um, it's in the image or whether it's elastically applied, it'll run that script. If it's in the image, it'll run the script called from a startup script, one of the scripts that was in that folder that I showed you, actually runs any of the layer scripts on startup, right? So it would actually run the script as, in the system context on startup. If you put this in here in elastic layer, what happens is right before you log in, it mounts those layers and it will run the script as the layers attached, again, in the system context, not the user context. What, what kind of script can you use right there? Command file, right? You can then call whatever you want from the command file, but it needs to be a command file. So I now finalize that layer so it's going to finish that one. So let's go back to here and see what we had next. So we did create the platform layer. We installed the PVS agent. We configured PowerShell. We created the app layer, right? Now we're going to do create an image template and publish a layered image, right? That's the next thing. All right. So if you click on the images tab here, this is where you have templates. And the idea here is that for each different, and we're talking PBS today, right? So for each different VDisk I want to create, I'd have a different one of these image templates. Um, why would I have more than one for PBS? Remember the, the rules we talked about around what, can, what has to be in an image and what doesn't, right? If something has a kernel driver, I can't use that elastically. I need to put it in the image. So if I have two sets of users that each need a you know, some need that kernel driver app and some don't, I'd have to have a different image, one for the one group that doesn't get it, one for the group that, that does get it. Um, if something has a third-party driver, Windows keeps third-party drivers in a file and access, basically an access database, a little bit slightly different one, um, but it's a single file. So if I, ins with normal layering, if I install two third-party drivers in two different layers, they'll install something into that file, but the one file is going to overwrite the other one when, when it sees it or when you put it back together, right? Um, what we do when we create an image is we're smart enough that we take all the drivers, take them out, and we recreate that database so that all the drivers from different layers are then on that VDisk available in the Windows driver store for that we create for the image, right? So that's pretty advanced. Nobody else can do anything like that, but you do have to have um, those files be in the image for that, that to work. So I can't include, if I include more than one third-party driver in Elastic Layer, um, first the system isn't going to see it, and then um, one's going to write over the other. Right? So I, those are different reasons why I might need a different image, to, and then, of course, I'll need you know a different catalog and, and different delivery groups to go along with that. A really good question just came in about Windows 10. Because um, with Windows 10, um, how are they? When, uh, sorry, I can't read. <laughs> with Windows 10 and how they come out with new builds, how are app layers affected by those new builds uh, being applied to the OS layer? Um, so far, we haven't noticed anything that happens. So we did. We do make it so that you can upgrade. So on Windows 10, when you do. Um, 
when a new version comes out, right, you can actually say, I want to add a version. And we do an upgrade, and, and of course, you're going to go and you're going to remove the windows.old and do all of that. Um, but as you know, the, the, there are certain things that change when you do that because it's not really an upgrade, right? It's really a new version. So it is possible that some of your applications would, would have issues. Um, we haven't really noticed that to be a big problem, right, to, per se, but you certainly would want to retest a little bit before you roll that out to everybody. All right, so we're going to create a new template. So you can make these names whatever you want them. What it's actually going to do, um, when, it, when we push up the PBS, it's not going to call it this. It's going to call it what the disk is defined. So I'll show you where that is, but it copies this to start out with, right? So this is the, you know, you want enough in the, name of your image that you know what it is, what it's for, right? So I'm going to call it POC PVS 7.12 for Win 7x64. Any image you want, pick the operating system. Again, I'm, we're doing Win 7. Which layers do you want in that image? So let's pick Office um, and this utility layer, which has a, a few other apps in it, right? I think I have the vSphere client and some other things in the utility layer. What if uh, Office required FileZilla to also be installed? Then you pick FileZilla. It's not going to tell you. You need to know. <laughs> um, okay. Then you need a connector, right? So um, we're going to push this image up to our new PVS server, right? So I don't have a connector for that. We just installed it. I'm going to say new. I'm going to pick Citrix PVS and say new again. And let's do um, now in your name, don't include PVS connector because it's actually going to put PVS connector in. So if you put PVS connector in the name, you'll get it in there twice, right? So just put whatever you want for your configuration for your name. Now here, remember I said that when you install the agent, it tells the Elm. We, remember we put the Elm appliance in and the password and stuff. So it already pre-defined uh, itself in there. Um, if you never ran that agent installer, you wouldn't be able to pick it, and I would, and I would know that I did something wrong. Right? Um, the user that you use here to integrate has to be a local admin on that PVS server, and it has to be a PVS admin on that box um, for it to work. In fact, you know, I'm going to go in. I don't remember if if it was a local admin. <laughs> Let me make sure. I think it is. Let me make sure. Okay, yeah, that's the account I'm using. Good. All right. Um, you put your password in, you check credentials, and it'll actually go make sure they work. And you'll know it works because it's going to fill in the, this information, like site and that kind of stuff. So my site is called site. Right? Don't get confused by that. But it, if it didn't work, you'd get an error. Since it worked, it pulled back the information. You know that it should be OK or it wouldn't be able to get that information. Um, PVS connector, so you're going to configure how you want PVS to be. right? So I always do cache and RAM with overflow to disk. And I do 512 megabytes on, on VDI. Um, and however you want your settings, if you're enabling load balancing, you can you can set that up the way you need it to. Um, we automate that, so when we push it up, we set all these settings right on the V disk when they're there. Okay, click. Remember to click save. You don't want to close before saving. Okay, and then I got to find that connector I just added. There's okay. Next, remember hey. we want to pick our platform layer that we created. Hey Rob, um, I don't know if you want to, if you addressed this before, but Elastic Apps, max number of uh, of apps. Uh, this this comes up I know uh, pretty frequently. 
I, I didn't address it, but so there's a theoretical number and then there's a practical number. The theoretical number is 1,027 on a machine. Obviously, you can't have a, connections to 1,000 layers, right? And I don't think it would perform very well. Um, and the answer is, you know, how many you can have realistically uh, depends a lot on your infrastructure, um, your networking. Uh, it depends a little bit on the apps and how they're used. You know, I, I don't think it'd be a big issue to have 20 or 30. You know, if you had 200, I don't know. We haven't tested with 200, right, kind of thing. I think you have to kind of play it by ear. But I wouldn't design a solution expecting to have, you know, 500 of them, right? I would expect, I'd be expecting to have more like, you know, 40 or, or something. Now, remember, for each one of those, you have a connection open to the file server persistently from every machine. So if you're doing VDI and you have 5,000 machines and they have 40 each, that's an awful lot of connections, right? So you, you have to be careful with that. Also, remember, you can have five apps in a layer or you could have one app in a layer. Right. So you can cut down your number of connections by putting applications together if you think you're going to have a lot of them. Right. Yeah. We're going to pick our platform layer here. Um, here you define, and you have to kind of know or guess. I'm going to use um, 30 gig for this because I know it's big enough, but you want to kind of add up the different things and make sure that your disk image size is bigger than you need it to be by a little. Um, of course, if it fails, you can always do it again. It's not that big a deal. Um, and I'm going to turn on, in this case, just to test. Actually, I'll turn on both. I'm going to turn on um, application and user, right? So when we log in, this is Windows 7, right? You'll see my user layer will pop in. Oh, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Uh, shoot. If I do that, then I'm then I'm not going to be able to show that nice app we have. So I'm not going to do user layer yet, right? I can show that somewhere else. Um, let's just do application layers, right? So this is the thing that turns on elastic layering application layers only okay if you do none you're just doing the image management you don't have any elastic layers okay. create a template and once I create that template um, here I can just say publish it and it'll publish up to that PBS server now you know you can make let's say I change office right so just to, to show you how things work let's say I update office for one of my images, just pick one. Um, let me pick this one, right? I can then say update assignments, pick a version. And of course, I only have one here. Uh, all of my image templates that have Office in it for that version will be here, and I can update them all at the same time, right? So I can, you know, if I had 20 images that all had Office, I could click on all 20 of those here and say update to the new version. Right. Then I would just come back here and I could select multiple of these and I can publish multiple. Right. You can select all your images and click publish. We'll actually do four at a time till they're done. Right. We don't do more than four at a time because we don't want to do too much, but we will pump up lots of images if you let it go on your way home to pump up. Just be careful. You want to make sure you have room in your store for that number of images. Um, again, if I click on my task, it'll tell me what it's doing. Right. It's compositing my image here, so it's taking the different layers. It's going to put those together. It's going to then combine the registry together to create the VHD. It's going to then upload the VHD into that PBS store automatically and then add it in to PBS when it does that. Um, and we'll let it run. What it ends up looking like when you do that is this. Um, now I wonder... You know what, hold on a sec. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Mm, it's not helping. Never tried that on this. No, you can't really change it. Sorry about that. Um, what it ends up looking like, and I, I apologize for it being small for you guys, is there's a name of the image. That name of the image actually comes from the disk name on the template. So if I go into this template we created, and click edit, and this name here where it says layer disk file name, that's going to be the name of the image in PVS, right? So you can make that name whatever you want it in your image, right, however you want it to be. 
um, and it'll show up in PVS that way um, as that with a date timestamp, right, if you see here. So here you see PVS Win 10, 2017, 4, 27, 14, 7, 12. That's the exact time that it was published, right, as a timestamp. Um, if you're into scripting, we did do some scripting. I got some help from one of our developers, and I created some scripting where it actually will do, use versioning for PVS. So what it will do is um, we publish it into PVS. It comes in with the, the separate long name. We then remove that. We rename it as a version and add it in as a version. It's not using an AVHDX file, but it is using versioning, so you can use promote. So then you can test and promote using PVS versioning, even though it's still a full VHD file. Right? Some people like promote. They don't like drag and drop. Right? They don't like the danger of possibly putting that in the wrong place. Right, so there are ways to do that via script. Right? And again, we automate that process um, by being hey. able to call a script from a connector. Hey, Rob, when you're back in the console, can you show how you can see what is in an image template, what apps are in them, for example? Sure. So there's two ways to do that. You can just, we call it poke the eye, right? Poke it in the eye here, and it'll show me layer assignments, so the layers that are in the image right there. Um, See so up here, it'll give you more information, right? It'll tell you the format of the disk, um, if elastic layering's turned on, right? And then it'll also give you a history of what's happened, an audit history of what's happened in that layer, right, if anything's happened. That's all part of poking it in the eye. The other thing you can do, of course, is click Edit on it um, and go through the screens and see how it's set, right? Now, one thing to notice here, the OS layer, when you're ready to change versions of your OS layer, this is where you do it, just like the application layers, right? If I wanted to roll back Office in this image to an older version because I was having an issue, I would come in here and click the older version, right? Then publish it, and it would publish this version instead of that version. Yeah, we had a, a, a customer earlier today that we were working with, and uh, just in POC, he had um, applied a Windows update um, that ended up not working for his environment. And um, you know, it was pretty interesting. He could go in because they had about three different admins. They could see who was doing changes, and they could actually see who made a change today uh, that caused the issue. They were able to just point back to an older version. Um, made it made it pretty easy for them to kind of roll back where they said that would have been weeks of trying to figure out what went wrong before. Uh, and I'm um, Right. It just seemed kind of timely for today, but it really did happen today. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's one I've been doing a lot with. So you can see the history, right? Who does what as part of that. You can see I did a bunch of things here, and before it was the administrator. And that's, I'm the only one who uses my system, but I used to log in as administrator and I changed to logging in as me. Right? But it'll show you, you know, I did a publish, I changed an application, you know, did a publish, the different things that that you do, right? Added two applications. So, and and that's the thing where um, we by default keep it for 180 days, but you can change that right, for shorter or, or longer if you want. Okay, still letting this thing publish. Um, you know, what I think we might do because the the next step is actually to take something that's been published into PVS and show you how to push that out to um, make targets, et cetera. And I'm actually not going to use this kind of, this is my backup PVS server because I don't have all the images on it. I'm going to go to my primary PVS server. So I'll show you how to do that. Um, before we do that, I think I had a slide to, to talk about it. And I, you guys might all know this. You might be experts, but in case somebody is not used to using PVS, right, because we do have some people who are new to it. Um, there's two wizards in PVS to help you create targets automatically from the VDisks. Um, the one that I think is much easier is used for VDI. It's the Zen Desktop wizard. Right? There's also an, a little bit older version called the Stream VM wizard. Um, what I like about the Zen Desktop wizard, it does more for you. Right? The Stream VM wizard you generally use for Zen app, right? Because the Zen Desktop wizard doesn't cover Zen app servers. Um, but this will ask you for certain information that it needs, but it'll automatically not only create the targets, put them into a catalog um, in the DDC, it'll also 
configure those machines for the cache with overflow to RAM by adding a disk into it, formatting that disk for you and making it ready, which is really cool. If you use the stream VM wizard, you have to create your own template to use for that. And you have to go in, create that template, create a D drive on it for your cache disk, format that drive, then actually remove the primary drive and save it and use that when you deploy. So the Zen Desktop Wizard is easier. The Stream VM one is something you have to use if you're doing Zen Ops servers. There's a little more configuration for that. So we're going to go through this one, right? But it automatically adds to the catalog, adds to the collection, um, adds the disk in for cache with overflow to, to disk and configures the disk for you. It does all that. It's pretty slick, actually. The only thing it doesn't do well is remember all your settings, which would be nice, but can't have everything in life. Okay. So we're going to do the Zen Desktop Setup Wizard here. Okay. It wants your delivery controller. Of course, I've already put that in before. It wants your host resource. So for me, I'm using vSphere, so I have a host resource that's my vCenter as part of that. I also have a Zen Server one configured. Right? Um, wants to know the credentials that you're going to use for the account. Um, what template it wants to use for that. This is the one I'm going to use for Win7. The image that you want, I'm just going to take one of my Win7 ones. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we'll use that one. Okay. Um, you can create a new catalog here or use an existing one. I'm going to use an existing one. I have this Win7 one. How do you want to configure machines and how many to create? Let's create three machines with two processors, and I'm only going to use two gig of RAM. Um, it defaults the cache disk to six gig. That works okay for me. It's not really. It, it has to do with how long you leave your machines before you reboot them. The longer you leave them, the bigger you need to make that disk because it'll fill up more. Are you creating accounts in Active Directory? We are. We're going to let it create accounts. I went and deleted the old ones. What OU do you want to put them in? So I have an OU for Zen Desktops. How do you want to name them? Right. I win seven Zen Test. Obviously, however you want to do it. The um, pounds you put in will go with this, right? A through Z or zero through nine. And it's going to go and do that now. And most of the time it works. I did have yesterday when I was testing that once it didn't work and I had to do it twice. So, Rob, you're just using the Zen desktop setup. Was there, I don't know how far you go back with PVS, but... Um, you could do this, obviously, the manual way, the old school way, just as easily, right? I mean, there's no nothing special about the wizard and Unidesk. No, it's just easier from if you're using cache with overflow to disk, it creates all that for you. But, yes, you could, right? So if you, if you did it manually, obviously, you'd need a template that had the disk in there and formatted and everything, right? And then you could deploy okay. from the template, um, okay. create the, the targets, and then add the targets in. Of course, this is deciding to not work for me, so I'm going to... Oh, there it goes. Oh, it didn't work because I didn't click finish. That was, what do you call that? The thing between the keyboard and the, <laughs> and the monitor. Got something to do with idiot, and I'm not sure which yeah. one. <laughs> but hey, we were all sitting here looking at it too, so... <laughs> That's pretty bad. Yeah. Okay. So it did work. Worked fine. Um, I was thinking it did that first, then you finished to get out, but, but it's not the case. Um, so if we come in here, actually, <laughs> I have to say something, right? Um, 
it should put those. Let's see, where does it put them usually? Good question. Done. That's done. Me. That's interesting. I created these guys. I'm going to move these into here. Okay. All right. Now, if we go to the DDC, we should see. Actually, that was, I'm sorry. If you go into the catalog, not that that was a delivery group. Because remember, it asked us for the catalog. So in this case, it puts it right into the catalog for us. Uh, well, you'll see those machines in there that it added in. So then all we have to do is go to our delivery group. Find the right one. Is this one? I have one little host here, so it's not, not everything's the fastest. Right. Well, I've been kind of leaving you alone with questions because I didn't want you to get slowed down too much because I know this is what people want to see. <laughs> okay. All right, so that added those machines in there and then they should Let's see if they're booted up. They are. Let's see if they're registered. And you can, not yet. Getting there. Let's see what they're doing here. Okay, it's rebooting. Now what that means is that it found a driver um, that it added, so it's probably, oh, you know, it might be rebooting because of that cache disk. They created the cache disk and it's rebooting. We'll see when it comes back up, we'll plug in. Any questions while we're waiting for that to do its thing? Yeah, I don't think so. I think people have kind of stopped on the questions, and I would encourage okay. people to continue asking questions. But um, Hey, Rob, uh, this, this question's come up a few times, and I think we've kind of addressed it, but um, uh, I just thought maybe you wanted to talk about, I know you briefly talked about versioning. Did you touch about the... Uh, I didn't hear you talk about it anyway. The the script that can go and read the uh, the VDIS name and version. Um, so that we can configure versioning. You mean I did? Okay. All right. Um, I don't know that if was... I showed it though. So I think actually I think I even showed it. But let me if you um, that's where it configures it. This yeah I did I showed it just. But okay. No, actually instead of configuring it with date timestamp, it'll actually configure it as a version. I knew you talked versioning. I didn't know you talked about the script. My bad. Okay, you're reading <laughs> the questions. Yeah. Uh, where was I? Uh, here. Um, and the the yeah the script. Uh, somebody asked where that's available. Uh, today, I guess you'd have to go back to the uh, Unidesk site to get that that script. Correct. The, those scripts are on the forum. There's a scripts and utilities section of the forum. You can get them from there. I don't know if that's going to move over at some point, but at least for now, that's where it, it is. It will, but Citrix wants everything signed, so I have a bunch of work to do before I can get it to be published on the Citrix site. We're working on that. I We're working on a way that development will sign all my 30-something utilities that I wrote. It only takes time. Yep. 
and a lot of work. I was curious, any um, on that the PVS script, has any of that, um, any, any talk, uh, I haven't heard it mentioned from product management, but about that, I, I know at one point it was talked about putting that in the console. Putting what in the console? The versioning or? Yeah, the versioning. Um, don't know. I mean, the, the cool thing is that our developers and the PVS developers are now in the same room, right? They're in the same building. They work next to each other. They have the same boss. So I would expect things like that to start happening. Right? But, come on. There's a lot of stuff we need done, though. So you know the order. Who knows? That's true. All right. My DDC is now deciding to be touchy. <laughs> there it goes. Okay. Well, there's one register. That's all we need, right? So let me go into receiver. Click on PBS. I didn't think it through. I'm actually hoping this image I deployed doesn't have um, oh, I want no bad plus plus in it, but we'll see. If it does, then I'm, I'll have to do something different. <laughs> I think somebody earlier asked a question that, that actually Andy or David, you guys might be better to answer this question, um, talking about um, the workflow capabilities that you can get uh, that sit in front of uh, storefront and, and, and you know compatibility with Unidesk. I can say that on the Unidesk side, there's no compatibility just because there's no, we don't have that workflow API. But uh, I don't know if there's anything you guys would want to say on the on the workflow side, the Citrix side of that. Yeah, Rob, I don't really understand. Say that. Say that again. I didn't quite understand. I think the uh, the question was around uh, the way you can um, set workflow for request of an application uh, today in uh, kind storefront. Of storefront and. You know where where would that you know translate into an app being put into either an elastic assignment or um, uh, into a layered image? At least on the on the Citrix app layering side, there's no mechanism to receive that yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I I don't know a lot about uh, the Citrix workflow product, uh, and within Storefront, I don't think that exists unless it's gotten in there recently, and I haven't seen it. Okay. It's more of a, there's a store back there and you can subscribe to what's in the store, but I don't think there's any mechanism. I know technologies like Res, uh, Res, uh, oh, what do they call it? Uh, Res has a product that will allow you uh, IT store automation that will allow you to generate something like that. Well, right. my DGC is being finicky, which is not good. When you're doing a demo, Let's you didn't close. pray to the right demo gods. I guess. Either that or I have too much running on my host, <laughs> which could be. It's just the uh, console is not refreshing or it's crashing. Yeah. Well, and then I tried to connect with the receiver and it's not connecting either. So let me. Uh, I think that's in a different vCenter altogether. All right, well, as we say, this is a POC, so we're going to go take a look and see what's going on on that. Of course, unfortunately, we're getting short on time like we did last time. That's right. So the delivery controller, you went to launch the studio and just kind of hung up on you? Yeah, the studio's kind of locked up, right? I'm trying to see if 
I need to reboot the DDC or or what? I'm so glad you're on that side of the demo and not me. <laughs> All right, let's just take a look at this thing, see what it's doing. Not doing a lot. You know what, let's try this. See if that matters. Sure seems not happy. We'll restart the DDC since it's being weird. I don't know if it actually restarted or we're just getting in from before. No, it looks like it did. Okay. No. Huh. But there you go. Meanwhile, it's working again. So you have okay. a machine that did not register. You can yeah, look, look on the. Uh, well, it says unregistered, right? Yeah, but there's one register. I don't give that one a try. Oh, I'm Only sorry. Yes, one. you're right. You're right. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's still not and connected. And technically, Rob, so. do, you, do you even need to go through Zen Desktop to show what you're trying to show? Or, um, I don't. You could log I can log directly into the machine. Yeah. Um, I think that'll get the same point across if you just skip the... Yeah, uh, since we're in a hurry, let's go ahead and do that. Actually, we'll... you know what? Hold on. Oh, actually, I didn't get a network connection either. Ah. Okay, so there's just something wrong with this image. You know what we need to do? Hold on, let's use a different one. I'm actually going to take an older one. Now there's something you would do in production if you had a problem. Make sure it's, yeah, okay. So you're just going to boot from one you'd already used before just to prove it works? Yeah, actually, that one we were on was not the one we created. That's a whole different PBS server. It was just a different one that I had created before. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I'm going back to an older image than the one I used just to, to try to see if there was something wrong with that one. Not that I remembered there being anything wrong with it, but that's what I get for not testing it right before. Yeah, the old have time to test everything. <laughs> that's the old I can't sleep the night before because I didn't test everything moment. <laughs> like tonight. It it does bring up something that's really important to me. N n don't let you know. We're, I was working on somebody who was using that versioning script, and when we push it up, we put it in test mode, and he wanted it to go to um, 
production mode immediately, which would mean it would roll out immediately. And I sent them a couple paragraphs of why I didn't think that was a good idea. You do definitely want to test images when you push them up before you roll them out to everybody. Because you never know. Okay. So we're going to log in as my domain user. has in it. Let's take a look. So FileZilla. Now the way you, by the way, for elastic layering, the way you would look, it's actually a um, log file in program data. Um, Unidesk. Logs. And this will tell you kind of some neat things. If you have elastic layering turned on, it'll tell you how long it took you to log in and what layers it loaded. Um, and you'll see here this FileZilla that I loaded was an elastic layer, right? That's what that's saying. And just to give you an idea of performance, right? This, this is running off the network, but performance is good. Now, of course, it's a small lab, small network. I don't have hundreds of users running against that, um, but it's there. And you see, I didn't figure out in that version how to disable updates for FileZilla, but that's running as an elastic layer um, versus the layers that are local, which should be like Office, I would imagine I had on here. Well, that brings um, up a good question. Somebody asked about Office earlier. Um, you know, historically with AppV and ThinApp technologies like that, you went ahead and put Office in the image. I'm guessing that with Unidesk, you want to put it um, in either the um, traditional layer or in the elastic layer. First of all, do you put Office. the use? Go ahead. Office is a .NET app, so it's better in the image, right? Also, also Office, if you use OneNote, has drivers, third-party drivers, so it would have to go in the image to use OneNote. Um, you can, Office, I, I've used it elastically. You know, if you're not using OneNote, it'll actually work, but we do recommend it be in the image, right, for, yeah. as part okay. of that. But you do recommend uh, using Unidesk and putting Office in a layer, and specifically the, uh, the, the base layers, the base layer. Or the layer. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, Office goes in its own layer, right? And then it's just that when you publish your image, you include Office, right? Yeah. So, you know, you'll always see Office in a layer, right? Not, yeah. you, you don't include it in the OS layer. It's in its own layer. But remember, we combine it all together, right? So that's fine. The, the only question is whether you include it in the image when you publish your image or whether you actually deliver it elastically where it's dynamic on login. Um, what people try to do, and it's not trivially easy, what they try to do is do Office and and do Project Invisio in a elastic layer, and Office is part of the image. Um, you can do that. The licensing is complicated. The scripts that run should take care of it, but it is a little more complicated. If you can put it all in the image together in the same layer, it's a little easier, um, but you don't have to. There are ways to do it where they're in different layers and you deliver some, not all, for that as part of that. Um, okay. Um, now, how do you, we didn't go through how do you assign an elastic layer, so we can do that now and then I'll log out and log back in because I wanted to do that. So we um, we did create this Notepad++ layer, right, um, for our POC right here. Um, I'm just going to, it's on the same, remember it goes by OS, but if I want to assign that elastically, I actually say add assignments here. And this add assignments will let you put it in a template or an elastic layer, right? But so you can pick a template that you want to put it in, but we don't want to use it in a template. We want to do it elastically. So here I'm just going to search for, and what I do is I name all my groups starting with the same thing, and then I can just find the group that I want and assign it to that. So this is Notepad++. So here I'm showing it just with one group. To get an idea of what I think you would normally do, it would be like this. Like, so when I was 
in dev, which I am, I'm the one packaging, I would click on, you know, a dev group first to assign it, um, which would assign it to me, then I'd log in and test it. Then I'd put it in a test group, which would hopefully be real users who would test it, make sure it was okay, and then you'd roll it out to the prod group, which might be, you know, a thousand people or whatever, two thousand people, that kind of thing. Um, in this case, I'm going to use my single Notepad++ group and say assign. Now what happens when you assign that is that it goes and it copies it out to the share. It's not in the share yet because I haven't assigned it. When I sign it elastically, it'll copy it out to the share and it'll update the JSON files that are what tells the assignment what to do. So if I come in here and I do, um, I look at my share, which is for me, it's a scale out file server clustered share. Um, then if I go under, you see all these these JSON files, these are things like the assignment files, right? So there's something that explains the layers. You can actually assign machine uh, machines elastic layers. So you can put in, you know, the machine name dollar into the group, and that'll actually, when the machine boots, assign the elastic layer to it. Um, or you can have this, which assigns the elastic layers to users by their SID, right? So if I were to look at this file, it would have a SID and then an assignment of a layer, right, for that user. Okay, um, so this is now out there, right? So now if I actually log out and log back into this, I should get that layer. I'm in that group. And it is on login, it's not dynamic. Oops, except this is a non-persistent desktop, so let me go find another one, hold on. Uh, you know, I don't think I reset this one, did I? Hold on. You know what? Let me see. Nope. We'll just be a couple more minutes. I know we're late. I apologize to everyone. That's okay. Time-wise. I know how the recording of people have already left. It's... So Bob asked a question. He said, uh, "Must be persistent or for elastic?" I I think that's no, right? Yeah, I don't know. Do you mean you mean like a dedicated machine to 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 people, a static machine? In, no, that would be a sign, and that may be, that may be what he means. But no, what he's really saying is like persistent. You know, the rights are are maintained. Uh, versus non-persistent, where the rights, whether MCS or PVS, are gotten rid of each time. Uh, I think that's what he right. means. So in 4x, everything in 4x for us uses a non-persistent model, though we do have this user layer that we're just starting to roll out. We have for Win7 that gives you persistence, but it's still user-based on a non-persistent desktop. So um, with Unidesk, all the machines would be provisioned as pooled. Um, non-static, right, shared pooled, and then when you log in, we're actually attaching the disks, right, so it's it's dynamic. So you do get high availability, right, um, as part of it. So the, the question... You know, that's two, everything was, uh, most people used actual persistent desktops. So Bob had a follow-up question and says, uh, well, why did, why did he have to choose a different desktop then just now? Because it rebooted because it's non-persistent. So every, <laughs> the one I was on rebooted because I logged out, right? Okay. Which, which happens with a uh, shared pooled desktop. I just wanted to log in quicker. That's why. Yeah. Uh, I, did I not put, let me see something. So actually, it's there, but I when I packaged it, I forgot to put the Notepad++ icon on the public shared desktop, right? So it didn't show up on my desktop, but it's, it's here. Okay. Another screw up for me today. And it wants to upgrade. Um, one interesting thing to note, if you're on a, session host, a ZenApp server, um, 
you can actually see the folders for other people's layers, but none, none of the files. So if I was um, logging in as a user on a ZenApp server that didn't have access to this layer, right, which is in here, they would see the Notepad++, they would actually see these folders, they wouldn't see any of the files, right? It has to do with the way that we're mounting the disks. So they couldn't use it, they wouldn't be able to see any of the files in it, but they could see the folder names. That's just a little errata, but if you see that, don't be confused by it when you do ZenApp. Okay. Okay. Um, that's it, though. Hopefully, people found that useful. Um, again, there actually are lots of webinars for all this stuff out. Uh, there's you can search in YouTube. We did a bunch of master series things. You can see different things that way. Um, you can certainly look at the first part of the series to get a little more information on MCS and rolling out some of the steps that we skipped for this one to try to make it a little shorter, even though it wasn't short um, for that. Okay. And if no, I think that's good. I mean, the whole thing about the POC concept is it's real. It's, you know, for the most part, we're not pulling a finished cake out of the oven and just showing it, or even worse, just showing a bunch of PowerPoint slides, which, you know, just basically a bunch of talk, talking heads. So this is great, and I hope people got a lot out of it. You know, maybe if we get enough demand, we'll do something else around Unidesk and do a part three. But I really appreciate your time and, and David jumping on and, and asking a bunch of really good questions as well. Yeah, it was fun. And, you know, if, if people out in the audience have ideas, you know, feel free to send them into the, the user group. We can maybe work something out from that too. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully there'll be some hands-on labs that Citrus will be able to make available to people. Um, again, I think I can kind of help spur that along. And then Robert Shaw, thanks as always for participating and helping to man the questions area. Certainly. A lot of uh, really good questions that, uh, that came up in the chat window. Um, and, and for those of you maybe who didn't see the chat window, there were some some links put out there to uh, to the, like the recipes and uh, and the Unidesk forum, so that's still pointed over to the uh, to the Unidesk side, and a lot, a lot of that will port over eventually. You know, um, there were several people that made comments about this being the best acquisition Citrix has done, and you know, for a lot of us that are you know, historically been in the space, this is probably the most practical uh, thing that Citrix has done that brings value to us. You know, a lot of acquisitions kind of sort of made sense, and some didn't, but this one is kind of a no-brainer for the Citrix admin. Uh, and beyond, but certainly the Citrix admin. Uh, so really glad to see this technology showing up in our in the product set that we that we know and love as uh, you know, Citrix. Well, we love hearing that. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks a lot. And uh, Stephanie, you want to kind of close us out? Sure. So thanks again. Thanks to everyone for showing up today. Thanks to Rob and Rob for presenting and taking us through all that. And Andy and David, we really appreciate your time today too. Um, we'll all be at Synergy. Um, if you head on over to www.mycugc.org, you can find our CUGC at Synergy page. That's where you can find us on the ground. Um, also, just remind you that you'll receive an email tomorrow uh, with a link to the recording of today's presentation and um, a link to the forum thread uh, where you can ask more questions. And I know there were a lot of questions. I will do my best to also post a lot of that Q&A on the forum for everyone so you can read through it. Um, and just thanks, everyone. Um, and hopefully, like Andy said, maybe we'll have a, a part three. <laughs> I'll see what the feedback says. Um, all right, so thanks everyone, and I'm just going to close the webinar out now and hope you guys have a really great day.